Right. Good evening, everyone. Um, the, today is Thursday, December 12, 2013. It's roughly 6.30 p.m., and this is the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee. My name is Judson Pierce, and I'm proud to chair the Stockholm Committee. We're missing a few folks tonight. Um, I know Dr. Allison Anthony is at uh, the middle school for a big concert. And Mr. Hainers is going to be a little bit uh, party. Linda Hansen's with us today uh, at the table from the AEA. Welcome, Linda. Um, my brief remarks, I, I must report uh, to you the very sad news of the passing of uh, Marie Carroll's husband, Rich. Uh, many of you remember Marie. Uh, worked in our superintendent's office for, for, for many years. She recently retired and made Rich's uh, memory be for a blessing, and may we all have a brief moment of silence. Thank you. Tonight we'll hear from our middle school and high school principals and what they see is necessary for fiscal year 15. We'll also hear a bit about a final end this week of a long chapter in our county school's history which pulled people apart. But before we do, I wanted to speak briefly on the legacy of Nelson Mandela, who also passed away recently. He was 91. As many of you know Mr. Mandela served uh, in the 1990s as president of South Africa, and South Africa's first black chief executive. His government focused on dismantling the legacy of apartheid. But before that, he was in prison for his beliefs for 27 years. And when he was released, he showed us his amazing capacity to forgive and his great interest in reconciliation. <coughs> Instead of exacting retribution on his captors, he expressed a want for peace and equality, a coming together, if you will, for a common purpose to achieve a set of higher ideals. He noted that if he were to be angry and revengeful, then he would remain a prisoner. So with that, I hope our teachers will teach our students about Mr. Mandela that our students learn to live by his principles. And we're now in December. It's our season of hope and light. So let Nelson Mandela's memory be a beacon in this coming winter. So I'm wearing my best of December bow tie, everyone. There's no lights. No, no lights? I know. Maybe for the meeting next week, I'll put some lights in the bow tie. Um, OK, well, we have a very special uh, beginning of our meeting tonight. We have uh, with us um, three eighth grade teachers, um, and they are here to present on the Odyssey Middle School Castles Project. Uh, we have Lucy Conway, Julie Keys, and Todd Sundstrom. If you would like to please just come to the come to the table here, um, I know we would have had some students here with us tonight, but for that wonderful performance going on. <laughs> So I thank you so much for coming. <coughs> Let us in on a little bit about what, what you're here to talk about. Can we start the slideshow? Yep. <laughs> we have a couple pictures of some of the research projects and a bunch of pictures of the sample projects that we did. This project is really a collaborative effort, and we appreciate very much the support of the parents and our administrators, and for uh, all the community, really, to make this a positive experience for all of our students. Uh, we are in awe of these castles and cathedrals and manors each year, uh, but behind the construction and all the group work, there are many steps of the research process that our students are learning here when they do these projects. From the pre-research on day one of the assignment to the multiple drafts of the work cited, to exploring and assessing a variety of sources, and we thank Edith Masson for getting fabulous books for us, for our students. Students engage with the research process in a way that is meaningful and motivating to them. And the culmination of these many steps of research, of course, is Castle Day, which is the day each year. You know, it, it, what, we, uh, you know, what we teach for many, many months is, is the Middle Ages. We have clearly three full units on it. And when we were thinking about best, you know, ways to incorporate our, uh, our goals for the year, um, 
that we're sharing as a, as a, a group um, that we're going to be incorporating throughout the year. We really want to focus on the, some of the big themes. Uh, when we talk about the Middle Ages, we talk about uh, yeah, the political system of feudalism, uh, the overarching uh, powerful institution of the Catholic Church, and um, of course, we, uh, you know, when we think of castles, we think of cathedrals, we think of manor farms. Manor farms are being called the economic uh, backbone of, of the Middle Ages. We couldn't think of a better way to put it together than uh, to hit these three structures <coughs> and uh, use this as a way to, to incorporate our topics of, and our, with our subject and also with uh, the research project that we uh, do throughout the entire year. So the process starts with kids either choosing to work alone or in a group of up to four people. We really encourage them to think critically about who they're gonna work with. We talk about scheduling. Um, project, group projects are something that you're gonna be doing for the rest of your life. So teaching these skills to kids about time management and getting together is as important as teaching the content with this. Um, the students have to design, they have to research the different parts of the building they have to create a blueprint, so we're bringing in some of the technology STEM skills that overlap with their tech and science classes. Um, and then they have to label the blueprint for all the different parts of the building, so they have to do some paraphrasing and putting all the information from their sources into their own words, and then they actually build the model. We encourage them to use recycled materials for these as much as they can, um, so we see some really creative ideas. There's a paper, paper um, sorry, origami nuns. Um, that one student created. One student told me that they went to a local tile store and asked if they had any leftover pieces that they could use because they were doing a school project and needed a floor. So um, we're really impressed with the creativity the kids come up with every year. We've been doing this for nine years now, and every year there's a new idea that comes up. It's absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Members have any questions? Sure. I remember doing this when I was teaching. Did you, did you use Macaulay's book, The Cathedral yeah. and the Castle? Yes, yes. They're great resources. Yeah, there's, there's many books now that, that, of that series, which is great. How long has this project been taken or going on? In, in Nine years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the nice thing is it's become a, uh, a tradition in school that brings the community in. Um, there's not been a first day of school in many years that we all have gotten the question, when we do the project, mm -hmm. you know, because the nice thing is that they come in as sixth graders and the entire school gets to go through during other classes to see it. So it's something they're very excited about. And there's this funny thing of you know, they want to outdo their predecessors and uh, always step it up a notch. So it's, uh, you know, it's been a, a great way to go into a break. And uh, the kids really work incredibly hard. I can't, I can't say enough about uh, how much they get out of it. It's, if you ask anyone or any parent that's been involved in this, it's a lot, it's a ton of work. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of it, we just had, we always have parent conferences right after it, um, so we get direct feedback. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so basically, you know, we, we get it's mostly positive. We, they talk about just a great collaboration, or even getting through hard times with groups uh, and making things happen. So it's been uh, a wonderful experience. How do you select the groups of kids that are going to work? How do they, is it random selection? They choose. Do they choose, okay. Yeah, and we're very conscious of uh, how scheduled the kids are. So it's not per class, it's per the entire cluster. They work with anyone in the entire cluster. Um, a lot of times, if so kids can choose to, lose, uh, to work alone, can choose to work alone, but uh, lots of times we encourage groups to get together. Um, and uh, you think the average group size is how many in the group? The maximum is four, okay. and uh, we, we prefer two to four. Obviously, we'd rather kids not be working by themselves, but sometimes just it's going to happen. Great. Ms. Oh, I was just going to say, and you know, speaking as somebody that's gone through this twice, um, I certainly have seen the evolution over the years, and you know, it really is nice knowing that just the level that you've taken it up to and um, the thought that you make the students go through in selecting their groups, it's in the three-year gap that I had between the first and the second iteration. Um, 
you framed it much better for the children in terms of what they needed to consider to have a successful experience. And so thank you for that. We're very lucky because the three of us have been the eighth grade history teachers for 10 years. So that, that's pretty rare in our schools. We have a lot of turnover. So we've been very lucky that we can um, evolve projects like this and really take things and learn from them and step it up every year. Yeah, our common plan here is this topic for a month fitting our curriculum in and making sure we have the students enough time. Because you know, Thanksgiving falls in different times. I come to do scouts, whereas like last year was quite early. We had to get a lot of things in early, and this year it felt late. Yeah. So, so, so it's great. Well, thank you very, very much for presenting on this. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can get some uh, new high school uh, castles built. Yeah. <laughs> New high school. <laughs> Go big scale. <laughs> I'd like to welcome, you mentioned Edith Marsan. If you wouldn't mind coming up, uh, you're a part of this early uh, operation here tonight. <coughs> You've been working with our students on uh, projects in a, in a new studio at middle school and uh, with ACMI. Tell us a little bit about that. So I could not. Uh, come with my students tonight, but I brought uh, the tools of the trade. Uh, we have 27 students enrolled after school this year, so which is uh, a big uh, improvement. Uh, eight eighth grader who have been with me from the beginning for the three years, uh, three past years, have been uh, transmitting all their knowledge. So they took upon them to do auditions. So we have informal auditions with iPad, and they love that. Uh, to me, it was very nice because afterwards I was able to look at every one of them and see where uh, the work stand and what we need to improve. Then we had formal auditions with the studio, so in front of the green screen, the camera and everything. And um, also my eighth graders did a writing for a press workshop. <coughs> so they were, uh, my new sixth grader learned to write for news and they really enjoy that. Uh, to the point that uh, people who were there from September did train people who came in November, and that was incredible. They remembered everything, and we did film that too. So I thought that instead of trying to bore you to death with a lot of things, we did film in 10 days, uh, film edit and everything, a little piece of seven minutes of what is ONN, uh, who is part of the UNN. Not all the students uh, are in the video, but still it gives you a pretty good idea of what we do. Also this year, we began to collaborate with teachers and we <coughs> do projects. We go to the classroom, students grab things from me and they try to take pictures or try to be accurate. Everything we have is served either for the UNN or for the newsletter and stay tuned for the beautiful ABCs from the other songs, which will be next uh, week newsletter. And now if you would please enjoy yourself, you are in for a little walk with the women.
the difference between when they did audition uh, for, for some of them six weeks before or uh, two months before and for this project. It's amazing the um, boost of confidence mm -hmm. that gives. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Public participation part of the section tonight. Do we have anyone here to speak? Um, public participation on tonight. Seeing none, uh, why don't we move on to the presentation of our middle and high school and their priorities for FY15. We'll start tonight with the principal of the high school, if that's all right with everyone. Dr. Jenger is new to the district. Welcome, Dr. Jenger. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we'll hear from you first, and, and Mr. Kim Roger, principal of the Austin Middle School. Welcome here tonight, both of you. Ready to go? Already. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay. 
Um, before I started, I, I just wanted to announce something which I thought was sort of a wonderful thing that folks would like to hear. One of our students, Hannah Blanas, um, has been nominated to apply for the Presidential Scholars Program. Um, so uh, that is one of the most prestigious awards a student can receive. There have only been about 10 students nominated from Massachusetts, I think. I was looking through to see how many won from each state. It looks like you get two or three per state. So that's a pretty amazing thing to have gotten to the point she's at. There were 141 students who won it that last year. So congratulations to her. We're very excited, and hopefully she will go on. So now I do my little presentation. So uh, I tried to keep it short, and then I just kept writing more, but I kept it on two sides of the page. Um, and I tried, my understanding of this process is there's a larger pro process of sort of going through priorities and nuts and bolts. And so what I'm really trying to focus on here are some big issues and big ticket items that I want the uh, committee to know about. And so I'm talking primarily about three real big headings. One is the building, um, which we're all aware of, but I just want to talk about it a little. The second and the biggest is the building and staffing issues, which come with and curriculum and staffing issues. And then the last is issues related to technology. Um, and every time I start into sort of one of these little speeches, I feel compelled to start out with talking about what the quality of the education we get is at the school, because then after that I start saying mean things about my own institution that make me feel bad. So I think it's important to remember when I talk about the building and the technology um, and the class size, that in spite of all of those things, we get really amazing results at the school. We're one of the top 25, and we've heard this before, um, schools in the state according to various different reports. Uh, one of the top 50 in the region in a state which is performing well above most of the world um, in terms of performance for students. That said, um, you've all seen the building. Uh, many of you have been on tours. I hope all of you will make some time to do that. We'll be happy to tour you around. Um, it was once a wonderful and grand building, but it is now well beyond its usable life. And we are going to fix it, hopefully, in the next four to five years. In the process, during that time, however, we will continue to have 100 teachers teaching there and 1,250 kids coming to school every day. And part of why we get the really great results that we get is because we have really great teachers who, in spite of the facilities and in spite of the technology that they've got, choose to come work here, I think because of the fabulous community, the wonderful students, and hopefully because they are treated well as professionals um, and therefore have a good teaching experience. That said, um, it would be very easy for us to say we're going to back off of construction, we're going to back off of uh, painting. Um, but if you look at the ceiling of the you know, locker rooms that are crumbling and falling, if you look at the ceilings of the auditorium which crumbled recently, or classrooms that have crumbled, those things would be need, needing to be repainted in four years anyway. So the paint we're putting on them now is just a regular maintenance issue. Um, so the two things that I wanted to say with regard to that, we have a custodial crew which I believe is staffed around 10 folks. We have never been fully staffed since I've been there. When I arrived, there were five or six custodians. They then brought it on contract. They've been trying to fill those positions. We've been working really hard. We have a new custodial crew chief. Jeremy Brandle, who's been working really hard to get folks working and to make good use of those folks. And in the last month or so, there's been a real change. Um, you'll start to walk around and see that the building is clean. We need to keep it that way. We need to keep moving in that direction. We need to get the mice out of people's classrooms and the desk <laughs> out of people's desks. Um, so that's the first. And then the second is we need to keep working on those maintenance issues. Um, you know, we're not going to put huge amounts of money into things, but if rooms are freezing cold or boiling hot or don't have electrical um, or don't have plugs, that's something that people need to fix right now. So I just want to make sure, I'm not actually asking for money. Somebody else will tell you what those, money, those things are. But I just want to make sure that we are on to make sure that those things continue forward. Um, so the biggest piece of this conversation will be about curriculum and staffing. Um, so first we have rising enrollment. The big enrollment changes right now are still hitting the elementary schools in Audison. Our enrollment is creeping up and will continue to do so. But in spite of that, um, we are sort of historically understaffed, and I'll talk <coughs> about why that's the case. And so some of that is hidden. Um, there are also things going on curricularly that are causing our class sizes to be larger and for us to have larger needs for staff, even with roughly, you know, with only small increases in enrollment. Um, 
And uh, those are. So if you look, for example, I just did a quick check. I tried to do this in PowerSchool and realized, like many of these questions, they are non-trivial. Um, the anecdotal evidence, and I will point to some folks who will speak to some specifics in their departments, is that we have very large class sizes. We spread them out in order to even out teacher load, but particularly in our higher end classes, so the classes that have students that work hard and are easier to manage, we have many classes well over 25. If you run a report, you'll come up with 102 classes over 25 um, and 26 over 30, but that doesn't include any of our heterogeneously grouped classes and classes that get split in power school. That ended up being more work than I could do by hand in a short period of time. Um, but you're already there just on a quick look. If you go through, and this is the hidden cost of the understaffing, in addition to those large class sizes, we are not supposed to have directed studies. Um, but if you look, you have 75 juniors and seniors. These are not juniors and seniors with um, senior privileges, which means they don't have to come in at the last period or the first period. These are seniors and juniors with holes in their schedule where they should have a class being sent to study hall. And they're being sent to study hall because we don't have programming for them. In addition, one of the things that hides the, the, the understaffing is our PE classes because our PE requirements are three years of PE. When a student signs up for PE, you would think that meant that they spent a period of PE all year long. But actually what it means is that three out of seven days, freshman and sophomore year, they go to PE. And the other three out of seven days, they go to a directed study, a study hall. Now that's, in some ways, there's some programming going on during that time for the freshmen and sophomores. For the juniors and seniors, they're supposed to take an additional PE class. Half of the students are taking what's called a PE contract. Now, for some of those, that fills a hole in their schedule. For some of those, that's something that they want to do. But it's roughly half, 150 students, many of whom are taking less than um, really rigorous programs as a way of essentially stepping out. The other students who are taking a PE class are taking one quarter every other day, which means 18 PE classes in the course of the year to fulfill the one-year requirement for PE. The other thing that happens to those students is after that, many of them end up in a directed study because we have no programming opposite. We don't have electives that are filling those gaps. Um, and there's really no way to program for that at the moment. So I think that's got to be a backdrop to the rest of this conversation. So um, I don't remember exactly how Kathy and I came up with this range of 4.2 to 6. <coughs> One of the ways I then subsequently added up the numbers came out exactly that way. But it seemed like a good range, depending on how you want to add up the numbers. Somewhere, depending on enrollments, what students sign up for, we see ourselves as needing between four and six new teacher positions. So the first ones I talk about are what I see as the hard targets. These really are, we need a teacher in this place to fill a very specific need. And I'm going to point, as I get to some of them, to the department heads who can give you much more specific numbers and a little bit more emphasis on those. Also, I'll start with math. Um, Math, right now, our state and universities have, are starting to expect and ask for four years of math. As a result, in the last year, year and a half, we've gone from having roughly 70% of our students take four years of math, 90% of our students taking four years of math. If you do the math, that's about 250, <laughs> he'll do the math better than I will, that's about 250 new math students all of a sudden showing up. Um, so it's pretty clear to us that we need at least one additional math teacher to support that. You want to say anything about that, Matt? Um, out of the 26 classes over 30, uh, just a quick calculation, I think 12 of those reside now. So there you go. Um, going on with science. Um, the issue in science, in addition to the large class sizes, is the small labs. So we've been put on warning. One of the big reasons why we were put on warning for our building beyond the general decrepitness of all the facilities was the size and quality of our, of our science labs. The MSBA would recommend that science labs be, that students in lab classes not be larger than 24. After you have more than 24 students in a class, the accident rates start going up because of the difficulties of supervision. That doesn't even include um, square footage. Um, I think Larry has told me that based on the square footage of our classrooms, and again, he's done the analysis and give you the numbers, I'll point to him in a second, um, our labs actually should have between 16 and 20 kids in them. Um, by adding this 0.4 science teacher, we'd be able to get our class sizes down closer to 26, still a little over what we want, and still too large for our labs. 
Nonetheless, we don't have the labs to hire additional science teachers to run their classes, even if we wanted to. Did you want to say anything about that, Larry? Sure. Um, in order to save time <coughs> in discussing that, I prepared a little sheet of four citations of, of research reports about laboratory size. So I will, I'll send that to Karen later, yeah. and she can distribute it to you. But those are from places like uh, <coughs> uh, the MSBA, who we're going to be dealing with soon, and uh, the National Science Teachers, uh, some school planning and management consultants, as well as uh, Flynn Scientific, which is one of our suppliers of chemicals, and they do some pretty detailed analysis. Uh, so, and, and whatever we're talking about now, as we look at the projections of, of population for the next four or five years, these are going to be even more dramatic issues. So, um, the, the current norm is 60 square feet per student. Uh, in 2010, the MSBA recommendation was 1,200. In 2000, after 2010, it went up to 1,440 square feet. This is for classes of 24. Our um, square footage in our science labs starts at about 850 square feet. Okay. We don't even make the 2010 standards except in two rooms. And when they raised the standard to 1,440 square feet, only one of our science rooms makes that threshold. So um, these reports talk about how when you increase the numbers, the accident rate goes up exponentially. So, um, and, and they deal with issues of not only safety, but also programmatic issues. Because we have a new set of standards coming up, the, nat the Next Generation Science Standards. That have, they have just come out, and the state is just finalizing uh, their, their final draft of where we should go with that Next Generation Science Standard. And they're uh, insisting on more laboratory work. They're insisting on more engineering um, projects and activities. And all of these are going to have square footage and support implications. And that will happen at the elementary school, it will happen at the middle school, and it will happen at the high school. So um, for all those reasons, I, I think, uh, you know, and, and the, uh, the MSBA also is asking for new labs to be based on uh, flexible space and spaces that can accommodate a number of different science disciplines, not just chemistry only in one room or physics only in another room. As you add and, and take away courses in engineer, engineering and, and um, oceanography, etc., and they go into different rooms, so you need that flexible space. Well, these are just some of the reasons. I'll pass this report out to Karen, mm -hmm. and then you can take a look at any of the data and the statistics on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So then I tried to break it down. The next ones largely have to do with the areas around reducing load and then generally supporting having programming for students. And I'm going to ask Carrie to speak a little bit about this. But there are two ends in the English and Social Studies classes. These large classes are largely grouped at the high end in terms of um, student performance and student expectations, or AP classes and honors classes. That means these are our classes where the, we do this because those are the kids that will bear a class of 26 to 30 um, or 36. But at the same time, those are kids with very high reading demands, very high writing demands, very high feedback demands. And you will see some of the teachers who are teaching these AP classes having upwards of 100 recommendations right in the fall to get our kids into competitive colleges, mm -hmm. which is an enormous burden on top of teaching the regular five classes. Um, at the same time, because our faculty are booked teaching those classes, we don't have anybody free to give discipline specialized support to our students in the small adaptive classes. So unless you have a special education teacher who is also a subject area specialist and certified in that area, then I go for support in that area. Carrie, you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so I, I first wanted to address um, the large class size over 25. And, and Matthew mentioned that it did not include the heterogeneously groups classes. All of our social studies electives, law, race and identity, Symposium and Current World Issues, our economics class, all of them are heterogeneously grouped classes. So if we included those, and they're all over 25, 
they're all full, 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 full. There'd be another 20 to 25 classes over um, over that 25 student limit or more target, I guess. Um, so I did want to mention that. But it is very limiting that right now in English and social studies, we've got no staffing flexibility. Every teacher is used, fully utilized all day, teaching large classes. Um, and both English and social studies are requesting some extra staffing. I'm requesting a 0.8 to dovetail with an existing 0.2. Deb Perry is requesting a 1.0 position to allow us just to have a little bit of flexibility to be creative. So for instance, in social studies, I would like to be able to offer a literacy focused smaller group section of world history, US 1 and US 2, to meet the needs of our students who you know, maybe are newer to the English language um, or have specialized learning needs that don't really require a placement in a sub-separate program, but still need smaller group and a literacy-focused approach. Right now, I don't have the staffing to do that. And having a little bit more would both alleviate some, not all, of the overcrowding in our honors, AP, and elective courses, but it also would give me the flexibility to meet the needs of some of our more at-risk students as well in the general ed context without them needing to be put on an IEP to access those needs, um, to have those needs met. In English language arts, um, currently Deb Perry is offering one section of a double block English as a regular ed intervention for ninth graders who need an intensive, literacy focused English experience. She's offering one section. There's high demand for that class. She needs to offer more than that. We'd like to be able to offer that in 10th grade, maybe even 11th as well, but she cannot do it at all um, with her large, <coughs> without increasing staffing. So that's specifically what that request is looking for. So again, going to the issue of overall staffing, that general pressure you see about not having being able to offer those <coughs> electives, that's what comes out now in the world languages and the family and consumer sciences. Uh, where those would exactly go, that's not a hard target because it really will depend on what students sign up for. Um, and you'll see my math isn't very good. Uh, world languages, when we had that discussion, felt like they could really use a full 1.0 teacher, which adds up to 0.2 Latin, 0 0.2, 0 0.4 Italian, 0 0.4 Spanish, and 0 0.2 Mandarin, which is 1.2. Um, so as you said, see my, that really depends on where the enrollment is and the poorness of my own math skills, which is why we need additional math teachers. Um, that was a joke. Um, and then similarly, we find the same problem in terms of electives around family and consumer science, so we don't know where exactly those will go. Um, we are increasing already this year, and we need, we'd like, we need to sustain that for next year, and can imagine that increasing the woodworking program, because we're reopening that up, so that's a point to what we're adding right now, just try out. Um, beyond that, just for supporting the general education program, and this is sort of an interesting sort of thing to back up on. Something has happened to the economy. I think it might have actually gotten a little bit better since September. The result of that is those wonderful TAs who are willing to work for almost no money upon which we were able to support the program actually get jobs if they're any good. And so what has happened was even though we set aside some funding to have some general ed TAs in the hall, front desk, and that point six building sub, um, anytime we get anybody who's any good, we lose somebody in special ed, we slide them over into a BSP position, and we try to do the position again. So there's two pieces to the funding issue here. One is I think we have to realistically look at the responsibilities we're putting on many of these TAs and increase them at least to what's called a BSP. It's not really, that's a, that's a salary level, not necessarily a title for a job, but to that level of funding, because we're not going to be able to hold on to those good people. Um, the second thing is, um, that we have, again, covering up this understaffing, you've all heard about Old Hall. Old Hall is not a workable solution in the long run for the school. When you send four to eight classrooms full of students to a large room with one TA and a teacher on duty, um, they are not having an educational experience. And it's not uncommon during flu season or when things really get stressful to have a kid who's going to be going through two or three classes in a day. It doesn't happen very often, but when it happens, that means that kid spent three hours of their day sitting in a big room doing essentially nothing. Um, and what happens is that's a large room that teacher's not able to closely monitor them. They sign out to go to other direct studies, the computer lab, the library, 
we end up with large numbers of students, largely unsupervised, dawdling up and down the halls to get to those places. Um, so educationally and in terms of supervision, it's really not a good solution. Um, we have really clamped down a lot of attendance. We've really clamped down a lot of kids coming and going. Some of the programming we've done in special ed has helped uh, to limit and reduce the number of what we call wanderers in the school, which makes it easier to support everybody else. But we really need to continue to move forward on that to be able to support all of those students. And so what I would propose is that 0.6 building subposition be increased with 1.0, and that we had add an additional building sub, the idea being that in between the old hall and those two positions, we'd have three permanent building subs who most of the time could actually be in classes substituting for teachers. And some of the time when we had to, we'd be then going to build the old hall during the day of that days. Um, in addition, um, we had we have what's called a Plato Lab, a Plato Credit Recovery Program. That was a program that existed last year. That teacher then got pulled into a classroom and is now doing that out of the goodness of their heart. We need as a teacher to be sub supporting that program. Students who end up in those credit recovery online pro programs are students who are not good self-directed learners. So giving them an opportunity to work on Plato or a credit recovery program at home or in their spare time is a way of filling their schedule but not their credits. They don't learn and they don't do it. They don't end up following up. So we really need to move back to having that position. Um, and then we also have, I think the term was MacGyver, I like that term. Um, there was a gap in some of the schedule, and so they are now covering our internship program, which is a new program we have. We have, is it 12 students? 14. 14, going out into the community, um, working, doing hands-on learning. That's fabulous. Please come when we do the uh, open house on that um, later this year. Um, and. Uh, but right now, it's being covered by someone who ideally will be pulled back into the classroom. So we're going to have to find that point to somewhere else. So again, when we talk about that four to six, um, I'm not necessarily asking you to pay for me to have a point to building coordinator. I'm saying as you look across these others, we're going to need those FTE because when we lose that person in music, Cheryl Crystal really shouldn't be supervising internships. Mm -hmm. um, she should be running a music class. That's her expertise. She's really good at it. Um, but when that goes away, we're going to need to find a social studies teacher or a family and consumer science teacher or an English teacher or somebody else who's currently teaching another class to supervise that. Um, and then moving on to special education. Um, so this year in special education, one of our really great successes, and there have been a lot of them, has been this off-site program. We have a growing number of students with mental health issues. We have a growing number of students also in this community who are in transitional housing <coughs> or in various sort of insecure forms of housing. Um, those students are not, as they come in and out of our community, are not ready to come into a building of 1,250 students. We're not equipped to handle them, and they are not successful here, not even in our behavioral program. So what we've created is an off-site program that serves a portion of those students. It has been very successful. Those students are now, it was originally formed with six. Oh, I didn't write my notes down for it. And Dave, is that right that there are now 12 students in the room? There's 12 students. And there are now 12 students in the offsite program. There are another two in transition, five who've made the transition successfully to the school. And then other students are being managed because that program often screens kids as part of a 45 day placement. They're not necessarily ours. And figures out where they should go appropriately paid for by their community. So there's about 30 plus students now that are being managed by that program who in the past would have arrived at our door and been stressing out our system. It's meant that our deans are able to attend to attendance and the other wanderers because they're not dealing with crisis situations. Um, it's meant that our behavioral program here is able to keep our kids from escalating because you're not getting kids that are beyond their capacity coming into it. Um, it's also meant though that the program grew by doubles and it's still only serving girls. There's a whole other population of boys similarly that should be served that way. It looks like we may be able to get facilities to expand that program and move it closer to campus. Um, the result will be, however, is the no good deed goes unpunished way that these things work, that we'll end up having a program that's sizable. Um, in terms of money savings, right now we're looking to uh, move the social worker as a therapeutic lead out there full time. Right now we have a point two social worker who is using way more than 0.2, pretty much all of her time in that program and therefore not serving kids within the building. If that person moves out full time, 
then what we would see replacing them within the building would be a half-time social worker and a half-time team chair. They have one and a half uh, special ed team chairs at Odyssey, we have one at the high school. So the idea would be to get up to that level in order to make things work better. Now, in the long run, one of my big hopes is you have to imagine the expense that we put into these out-of-school placements. Right? When we send one student off to an out-of-school placement because they've gotten elevated and are not being successfully served in a behavioral program or other programs, that's $50,000 for the district. So making those programs work successfully and serving the needs of these other students who are coming in successfully is really a win-win. So although I can't tell you where the savings is on the back end, I would imagine the long run doing it right the first time which is the measure once, measure twice, cut once, um, is eventually going to save us money. But we really need to shift money into that area. Dave, I know you want to say a couple of words about well, that. Well, I just, I just want to add to what Matt has said and kind of reiterate the, the situation with the TAs and the, and the BSPs. Um, we've been in a difficult situation in our behavioral program this year. We, we haven't been fully staffed since the beginning of the year, uh, simply because we had a TA that at the beginning of the year took another job, again, moved up to another position. We just had another one leave. We replaced the first one, the second one just left. So we've been understaffed in that program. And the, the, the situation is, is that we invest in those TAs. We put them to the TCI training, which is the de-escalation training. We put them to professional development. And we really make them specialists in the area of behavior. And, and then what happens is they get a job at lab or they get a job someplace else for an additional ten dollars or $15,000. And what's happening is we're really becoming, becoming the training tool for them. And so by, 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 by leaving them as TAs, when we really are developing specialists in those areas, we're, we're, we're putting ourselves at a disadvantage because then they do have the opportunity to go off <coughs> and get an increase in their salaries. So I think there's a, there are certain TAs in the high school that are working with our behavioral students, that are working with our autistic students, that are really working with a complex and difficult population. And if we continue to leave them at the salary in which they're at, we are going to continue to be a training grounds for them, and we're going to continue to lose the good ones. Uh, we just lost one to, to, to Lab Collaborative, who was an outstanding employee, who did a nice job for us. But we could not match the salary level that Lab was going to offer him as an entry position with Lab. So I think that when we talk about it with special education, about also you know rank changes in the BSP to keep quality TAs, that's something that we um, are concerned with in our special ed population. Uh, the TAs are the, the, the staff that's actually in the trenches with these kids. They're the ones that are in the classrooms with them. They're the ones that are de-escalating them and, re and, 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 re and redirecting them to the social workers. But they're really our first level of triage with our most complex population. So I think we have to really kind of look at how we're going to handle them to really be able to keep quality staff at the high school. And so then the last um, thing that I want to talk about, and again, there's a hard target and then a really we need it target, um, is technology. Uh, I think people, I think we need to realize the nature of education and the workplace that we're educating kids for right now. Um, people are working, we depend upon having effective technology. Our teachers are expected to do their grades, um, their attendance, uh, online, the students are expecting and expected to be able to do research online, be able to access all of those resources and are going to be expected to know how to use that when they get out. Right now our teachers are using five-year-old Dell desktops. They don't work anymore. About 50% of them literally don't work. So imagine if you're a teacher in a classroom and you're supposed to take attendance and you hit, you boot up your attendance and then you wait five minutes for it to load, during which time you've got a class in front of you which you start teaching. At the end of class, you remember you were supposed to take attendance. Um, you don't even remotely <coughs> try to stream video or to use any sort of the interactive resources that you could use because you can't reliably know that you're going to be able to reach it. So the way I think of this is we've made it, I understand Laura again can speak way more about this than I can, but Laura did a good or requested from the capital $300,000 investment in technology in high school. Um, that goes to all sorts of infrastructure that needs to go into the high school. Regardless of anything, we need to spend about $100,000 to give every teacher in the school a new laptop. Um, there's just really no way around that, otherwise we really should just go back to pen, paper and pen. Mm -hmm. I'm not even kidding, it's just not really worth asking people to do their jobs. So that's the first piece. In addition, 
in that environment where teachers are expected to use technology as an instructional tool, you need to be able to project that. You need to be able to project it safely, easily, and reliably. So many, most of our teachers have some form of a projector or a smart board in their classroom. But they make everybody have that and then to get the wiring and a little bumper so kids don't rip the cords out or knock the thing off the top of the table is going to be roughly another $30,000. And that's much of really a sort of off the top of our head thing. It's not as detailed as their plan. In addition, um, in the long run, we want to move to an environment where you're using instructional technology throughout the class where students can, I mean, Many, many, most schools, lots of schools all around the country, kids come to school and they have a device. One way or another, they're able to or they're supported in having some sort of a device. So a teacher can expect that they've got a classroom full of kids who can access digital technology. If we move to a bring your own device platform, even if tomorrow we said to the kids, it's okay, you can just bring your laptop to school. We couldn't do that. Because if the kids whose parents would just buy them a laptop with no support whatsoever, all started bringing laptops to school and getting onto our network, our network and our Wi-Fi would be done. We don't have the density, we don't have the coverage. So we need to put that network in place simply so we can allow people to bring their own facilities to the school. And in the next two, three years, we need to figure out how to support everyone being able to have access, what the program is going to be, and how to support the digital divide for the 10 to 20% of our students whose parents are not going to be able to easily go forward and get that. So that's something I think you also need to plan for in the long run. Um, and uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell my little story. I feel like the high school and this school in general, because of the high results we get, um, is like when I was an elementary school principal and people would come to me and say, I know my kid's really nice and he's really well behaved, so you're going to stick him in the class with a teacher nobody wants. Um, because you know he'll do okay when I don't complain about it. Um, I think it's really important that we not put our teachers and our students into that situation mm -hmm. because it's not sustainable over time. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chair. Uh, questions from the committee? Sorry for doing this time. I did have a question referencing back to um, when you were talking about the um, staffing needs in the science. I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Um, what I heard is that Right now, if we utilize our science rooms completely, which means every period and teachers wouldn't have access to them during their preparation time, that point four would cover it, and there really is no other way to reduce science class sizes besides that. Well, Larry, do you want to address the logistics of that? If you would, please come to the mic, so just make sure that everyone mm -hmm. has before. Yeah, I'm sorry, could, could you uh, clarify that for me? Just okay. Um, I, don't know, I can wing it, but it'll give it to you. Okay. No, actually, the, the, what, what I thought I heard is that um, the point four that you're recommending for science would mean that all the current science rooms would be utilized 100% of the school day, and there's no other space for anybody to be teaching science, so we could never really get the classes with the current um, number of rooms we have to that standard, even if we were able to give you more staff enforcement. It's, it's, a, it's a problematic thing, certainly, because there are 11 science rooms and 11.6 uh, science teachers. So right now, teachers share. So some teachers are itinerant and move into other classrooms, while on the primary teacher in that room is, uh, in a sense, uh, on a prep period. Or, or doing a duty outside of the room. So it's, <clears throat> it's an issue. Uh, there are, of course, the rooms that, that still have teachers in them that have a prep period. Most of the teachers are pretty congenial about this, and so they can be working in the side of the room while another teacher is teaching class. It's not ideal, but it's um, probably better than having 26 or 28 kids in a science classroom. We have 58 sections right now, and 14 of those have 26 or over students. So a quarter of our, our uh, classes, or, and probably if I went down to 24, which is what the recommendations are, we probably have close to one half of our classes that are over the recommended number of students. So um, it's, it's weighing the evils. 
So, so what I'm hearing is the only way we're ever really going to be completely able to address the science class size is through the construction of new science classrooms. That's right. You know, without have unless we totally utilize every room, every period of the day, and and sort of ignore the needs of preparing for the next class that's coming in by another teacher, setting up chemicals on lab tables, etc., while another class is in there. Well, with 11 rooms and 11.6 teachers, it sounds like you're already we're already yeah. spreading that thin. And, and now I'm asking for another point four, which would make it. 11 rooms and 12 people. So we'll be doing, we would be doing some more sharing. And it's not, it's not the perfect situation. But again, we're dealing with, um, with an imperfect schedule rotation for the teachers versus a safety issue for the students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the other question I had once again about staffing was, um, as I look towards the world language, it's my understanding that there are not many people that, are, as many people that are dual certified for multiple languages. Um, so, <coughs> is it realistic to find those partials for those languages, or do we actually have to perhaps build a bigger buffer in um, because we can't necessarily have people splitting positions? Um, I think it's a little of both. I mean, and I don't have a lot of history, but I mean, we do have these part-time, we have a part-time learning teacher, we have a part-time Latin teacher. So there are some staff available, potentially, um, and some of those folks are available. It would be a challenge. Um, yes, it's true. It is problematic if they don't get all teach the same language. I, um, having been through this multiple right. times, High school, we did have a priority about building our staff back up, um, and you know it's good to see that work continue because the ratios are far from ideal. Right. And we do outperform our resources, um, so it's from my perspective this is a nice balance between the three areas of need. But I also um, I also feel like this is a very conservative approach to what we actually still need at the high school as well. Yeah, so do I. I mean, what I would imagine in terms of the world language is that we're sort of we're saying to you, you know, here are these things we know. We know if you gave us this one, we put it into the math, the science, the world languages. But it, we really need another 1.0. And we're not going to tell you exactly how we use it because we're probably going to wait till March to see where the kids are signing up. And then we'll go out and figure out how to portion that staff to go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, let me put you through the usual uh, set of questions. Uh, if more students are taking math, what are they taking less of? No, I, my guess is probably not very much because there are holes in the kids' schedule. There are holes, so that basically yeah. what we're going from is holes to actually taking a class. So there is no uh, movement away from classes as people are moving into others. I haven't found anybody who's not broke. Okay. Um, we don't run classes with fewer than 18 unless there's some academic reason to do so, mm -hmm. you know, or a limitation in terms of facilities. Um, and you're projecting an increase in enrollment. Okay. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm, this is the question that I will not ask you to answer now, but I, and I ask this at every level. But, uh, you know, a, 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 an answer at some other point would <coughs> certainly be worth having is, what are you doing now that we're spending money on that may not be effective and you might not want to be doing anymore? So that if you're coming to us with an ad list, uh, sometimes it's much easier to play with an ad list if there's also a bit of a subtraction list someplace. And I'm sort of pushing back a little and say, not, not out of being mean-spirited or anything, but just in terms of looking at budgetary budgetary reality in that our resources are finite and it's easier to add when there's also some other some give someplace else that we're doing something that we maybe don't need to be doing anymore. So I actually do sort of have an answer to that because I thought pretty hard about it. Mm -hmm. One is that this isn't a zero situation. Mm -hmm. What we're dealing with is 
increases in curricular expectations mm -hmm. and increases in enrollment. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of you know, we're adding this on because mm -hmm. we want to expand our programs. Mm -hmm. We're adding these things on in order to be able to maintain our sort of higher levels. Mm -hmm. So students now are expected to take four years of math mm -hmm. to get into the local universities. Mm -hmm. They're actually expected to take three years of language mm -hmm. to get into the local universities. Um, and so there's an expansion in the need to program for those things. And we are already have been sort of systematically understaffed, so we're filling in gaps. Mm -hmm. That said, um, I'll go back to the other point, which is I think if we do these things right, mm -hmm. um, we're going to find ourselves saving an awful lot of money on kids who fail. Mm -hmm. um, because I think there's a lot of waste in that we are doing things two or three times mm -hmm. for kids because we did not have our acts together. Mm -hmm. And when you've been understaffed and everyone's been scrambling mm -hmm. and hasn't been mm -hmm. attended to, um, and I actually forgot to know a little blurb about athletics, mm -hmm. but in athletics and special education in particular, mm -hmm. um, things cost more than they have to mm -hmm. because you end up buying it because you broke it. The kid ends up going to an out of school placement. Mm -hmm. One or two out of school placements mm -hmm. break the bank. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's where we really find our point. We're doing it right the first time. Yeah, and the other thing, you know, there are lots of things in a high school that seem right in terms of policy. In, in that this could also be a policy question for us, is that if we're forcing kids to repeat classes, they may not, might not necessarily need to academically, but our policies are requiring that. You know, that, that's costing us money. Uh, things that we are doing that cost money that we shouldn't be doing anymore, even if they're programmatic, uh, or something that we've done because we've always done it before, uh, that don't make sense anymore. Um, we, we should explore. I agree. Also, <laughs> thanks. Yes, just a couple. Um, are there models out there for multi-use labs? Uh, I have visited a few schools around. Uh, recently, I went to Western High School. They have flexible labs. Of course, they have a brand new building. And so it's easier to do from the start. I, I didn't know if MSB, MS, the state, I know they push different things and things of this nature. If they had actual models of it. Other question I have. They do. They have actually on, on the uh, resources that I'm sending Karen, I, I've sent them right there. Okay. Uh, they have some model classroom designs on there. Uh, the students that are now in directed studies because of the needs. Get to follow up with uh, from Mr. Schlitzen's class. Are there any issues of meeting the required uh, credits by, by the time of graduation? No. Um, no. There are, I mean, I don't believe so. I think there is more of an issue in there are state requirements around the number of minutes. Right. Um, and we are um, broadly interpreting that the students are taking what the state would consider to be a full uh, for many of those students. Okay, just just a little logic then. If you're taking the full load, then we now require them to take the math course. But you told Mr. Schlickman they're not cutting anything. Am I missing something here? Say it again. You told Mr. Schlickman that with the new the additional fourth year of math, yeah, they're not going to be cutting something else to fit that in. Well, no. The question was, are there classes there for the people are moving away from? And my answer was, there are no classes that are not being fully enrolled. Okay. Okay. Um, obviously, any student who is programming is making choices about whether they're going to take, if they're taking a fourth year of math, in their own individual career, I don't know whether they might therefore not be taking family and consumer science. All I can say is, family and consumer science classes are all full, and we still have gaps in kids' schedules. Thank you. My last question. Does DESE set the st science standards? I'm sorry, what was that? Does the Department of Education set the science standards that you just mentioned are going to be updated? Or are these standards done by a professional organization? No, the, uh, uh, the next generation science standards are a national effort, much like the Common Core. They are not mandated. It's a, it's a nationwide program and it's only there for the states who opt into it. So Massachusetts has decided to take those standards and now tweak them a bit to make them their own. And then they will adopt them as the Massachusetts standards based on the national 
Things, will they have a ripple of, or an effect on the labs and things of that nature? They will. They're, they're very much oriented towards more laboratory work, um, more engineering programs, and, um, and they're also recommending the, uh, the certain optimal sizes for science classes. I have one question, I guess, from Ms. Johnson. What do we pay for a minute subs? Is it a set salary for a permanent sub, or is it very the building, the sub? building subs? Building subs, oh, sorry. They're paid at the same rate as the teaching assistants. So it's a, it's a salary. They're full-time employees. I mean, they're eligible for... I guess, to me, the idea of a permanent sub is a, a full-time teacher. No, oh, a a teacher, salary. TA salary. It's, it's 16135 yeah. It's just a permanent sub. Uh, I, I want to come back to a question about science labs, and I may be speaking for Larry, um, but... You were asking whether it sounded like you could sort of multiple use. Now, you know, if you said to us, we'd really rather give you two more science teachers, even though you don't have enough lab spaces, you know, you could rotate people through the labs. It would be a very challenging thing to do. But I don't know that Larry would say no to that offer of having additional staff. My, my son is a physics and chemistry teacher, high yeah. school teacher, and he has two separate labs. Right. And he, he would give anything to have one home. But you could do both. Things. Yes. Right. That, that wouldn't be possible in our building I without <laughs> serious renovation. <laughs> uh, you know, We're the working few woods take up the whole <laughs> part of the chemistry labs. And, and, you know, so that is ideal. Right. And that's what the new standards and the state MSBA is aiming for. But it's not going to happen here without a renovation. Thank you. I just wanted to. Thank you, Dr. Chair, for coming tonight, telling us what your priorities are, and, and Martin Hitz as well. Um, uh, I went on one of those tours uh, over the weekend, and I was, it was Iowa, said at least, because I wasn't in a lot of parts of the building that you took us to, and, uh, and, and built it, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I would recommend it to everyone out there. Mm -hmm. to, to see the high school inside now, it's just, there are parts of it that are just not usable. You're right. Um, I wanted to ask a question. Dr. Allison Ampey couldn't be with us tonight. She had a question regarding class size. She'd love to see uh, it broken out by subject and by grade, not just as averages. Um, so if that could be done uh, and shared with the committee, that would, that would be most helpful. And I, I will also add to that by level, because I think seeing the differences between class sizes and the honors and AP level and the Thank you very much. I think that what you're hearing <clears throat> is, uh, well, first of all, it's very accurate. And this is, there's a lot more that could be asked than is being asked. This is a very conservative approach. <clears throat> we are still seeing um, the effects of the reductions we've had over the years. We've mm -hmm. really not increased staffing tremendously at the high school or the middle school in the last few years. Uh, we've, had a, a, we've had a focus on a, a number of other areas, special education, elementary class size for sure. And as the enrollments increase, it is in, this is what is happening. And I think this year in particular, not that we didn't see large class sizes last year, we did, mm -hmm. but it is really growing. And I think that it's a testament to the teachers as to how well our students perform. Despite the fact that we have AP classes and in fact, probably a majority of our AP classes that are very large sized. Um, certainly that's true in, uh, everybody's shaking their head, yes, that's <laughs> because that's, we, we know that the students are motivated in doing that, the work. We are still, for the, in the fourth year in a row, on the College Board AP honor roll for the great work in terms of both expanding opportunity as well as maintaining a high level of students performing at the, the level they want to see. So it's really kudos to the teachers because, but I think it's really starting, you know, it's, it's, it's at a point where we really do need to take a look at staffing here because mm -hmm. this is just not sustainable to be having these, these, no matter how great our kids are, and they are great, to have these class sizes. The other problem with the, I think you saw on the tour, is that a lot of our classes are really not big enough. We're talking about, high school students that are well, fully grown adults, <laughs> in, at least physically. Um, 
that are in these classrooms, and some of them are sm so small. In fact, we were in one of the AP um, world language classes uh, during one of these tours, and it's a triangular room of about 400 square feet, and there's 30 kids in this classroom. Well, that's ha less than half the size of what they recommend for MSBA, but there are really no other places to be put in these classes. So there's a, a real sense of being cramped, and it's and it's a it's a challenge for teachers to to put students in group. We were um, I was uh, walking through one of the math math hallways um, about a week and a half ago, and looking in. There's a lot of group work going on, which is terrific. But you, there would be no place for a teacher to walk between the groups because they were literally so scrunched. And, and in some classrooms, you couldn't put your desks in that kind of configuration and have the number of students you have in the classroom. It just wouldn't work. And so you do see some classrooms where they line the perimeter, but meanwhile, you're, you're practically like this in the classroom with the student next to you. So it, it is something that we need to look at. We, we're not solving the configuration of the rooms right now. And um, quite honestly, the, the, the type of thing that you're seeing with science, with classrooms, it's the same thing with math. If we wanted to have more math classrooms, where would we have them? Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that. I mean, we have some, we can have some transient. But again, um, if you want teachers to have a you know, a place to do preparation, um, and sometimes in, in some situations, you know, setting up the room for next classes, you, they don't have that opportunity. It also is not ideal teaching environment. Um, I know that we've had um, some teachers who have been transient, and as much as they might love the school, uh, they're looking for some permanency in a classroom, and if they can't find that, they're going to look elsewhere. And we've had, we've lost a couple of good teachers for, for that reason only. Um, so it, it's, we're in a sort of a little bit of a bind here in that we do need more staffing, but we also don't have the room to have a lot more staffing, which would really make an ideal difference. So this is something that we need to take into consideration um, as we move forward with uh, hopefully doing a renovation of this building in the next uh, four years or so. Can I just say two more quick things? Um, there's a study done where they looked at these sort of excellent teachers, just one excellent teacher, and they looked to see what was the, the long-term outcome in terms of the students. And what was remarkable was that students who had just one of these life-changing teachers, the long-range impact on those kids in terms of earning, career, was substantial. Um, and so when we think about losing just a couple of really excellent teachers because we don't have a facility, um, you have to understand that that's a long-term impact on all of our kids. And then the second thing was when we were walking around, there was a question that was asked that sort of puzzled me a little bit of times. It was, you know, once upon a time this school had 3,000 kids. What happened? Um, it seems like a very big building. And I talked a little bit about, um, you know, some of the special needs settings that we have now that we wouldn't have had back in the day. Um, and some of the classrooms and spaces, the superintendent's office, the preschool that we have lost. But um, what I realized that was out of the picture is when you go back to the 70s and 80s, um, when we had 3,000 students in this building, that was a time when it was really considered perfectly all right that about 15% of those students didn't graduate. Um, and it was a time when your college, when your high school graduation requirements were four years of English, Buffing and now I actually have the. Um, I went back and got the little program of studies from 1960, 70, and 80. But it was four years of English, two years of math, two years of science, two years of social studies, and a lot fewer credits. Um, and so we have the same number of kids, but the expectations in terms of what they're supposed to do um, for all of them, and now we're expecting to have 95 plus percent of their kids going to college. The expectations that they need to get into those colleges are much higher, the requirements for graduation are much higher. So every one of those kids that's here now is one and a half kids from 1980. And so that's why we are stretching the space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on uh, to middle school. I'm very, very sorry we're so behind Mr. Rivera. I thought if you'd like to join the table. 
Mr. Conner. Uh, I'm just going to apologize. I will listen for a little while before okay. I'm going to slip out because I have a baby. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and anyone else who, who plans to speak, just just please come to the, come to the table. Um, uh, again, my apologies. Uh, I'm running a little bit now, but uh, I'm sure you'll hear about class size questions. On this yes. Um, yeah. I, I had a pretty good idea of where I wanted to start and what I wanted to say. And then hearing Dr. Jenga talk, I started taking notes. And now I have three pages of notes, and I can start in a number of places. But I would like to start with a couple of things that we are doing at the middle school. I'd like to thank the eighth grade teachers for coming. The Castle Project is always one of my favorites. And one of my favorite things about it is after they pick the award-winning uh, students, I get to hand out the awards, and we do it in my office every year. And it's just a lot of fun to see them down there and see their castles. It's one of my favorite things. Something else we have going on this week is it's Code Week. Um, we're using uh, um, a website called code.org in our um, digital citizenship class. We're starting to increase rigor as we talk about CCSS, Common Core State Standards, ma and bringing mastery, the new uh, leadership magazines, all the, the whole magazines about reaching mastery and how to get our students to mastery, and, and also increasing rigor. Um, these programs that we bring in, um, the underwater Lego robotics program that we have going, uh, the code.org website with Code Week. These are great things that really challenge our students. Uh, we have a critical thinking um, program that we're starting at the middle school with Sunda Ramsey, who's uh, one of our parents. I've been doing projects with him for the last five years. Uh, but we're really excited about the digital citizenship class because we're really going to, we've been working with the ADF and uh, staff plan. <coughs> And we're really going to do a lot more programming in that class. And this gives the, the students um, a taste of, uh, of how to do programming and how to think programmatically as far as computers go. So it's really exciting. So if you go on to Google Plus and you look for Jeff Snyder and you add Jeff Snyder, there's a video of a seventh grade class that is working through uh, a code problem solving uh, class and it's really cool and I'm excited to get into that more with the, with the students and that, that brings me to you know uh, thanking you for uh, the last five years of being able to help us develop a better middle school and I know that uh, you know what we need and you appreciate what we need but there are only certain things that you can give us so you have to be able to select well and I was thinking about this last night when I had my sons fill out their Christmas list, their presents, and I gave them the list. Last year, my son Matt just went for broke. He had he asked me for diamond earrings. He wanted a, a, an electric, you know, scooter and all these things. But they're getting a little bit older, so this year I could see them thinking, and they're like, "Well, I know Dad loves us, and I know he wants to buy us everything." But we know he doesn't have a billion dollars. So why don't we think better about what it is that we can ask for so that we can see what he can actually get for us. Because we respect that. So or at least I hope they do. And so we're going to be judicious with what we ask. So I'm going to try to do the same. So we have a lot of needs at the middle school. Our class sizes are up. Our enrollment is going to, to increase greatly over the next um, five to eight years. And I echo a lot of what Dr. Jangers has said. So a lot of what he has said applies to us. Now I'm not gonna take the easy way out and say, so have a good night. Um, we have some differences at the middle school. We don't have the same programs that the high school has. We don't have the singletons, doubletons, tripletons, AP, honors classes, and a lot of the other selections that the high school does have. But we do have our um, building needs, we do have our uh, staffing needs, we do have our security needs, and we do have material needs that, that I will go over. So even though there are constraints, we still create, I believe, a wonderful experience for our students. But each year this is done under the conditions that it's being done, and by no fault of anybody in here, as I said earlier, um, we do have to you know, harken back and think about what what Dr. Bodie said about five years ago, at the end of my first year, I had to cut 10 positions. We're still down seven positions. You know, 
When I, before I got here, there were five clusters in the sixth grade. Then my first year, we went down to four. Now we have three. We're graduating 312 students and 405 are coming in. So after going through this year after year and seeing more and more kids come in, it begins to take a toll on the parents. It begins to take a toll on the students, the staff, the administration, the school committee, the central administration. It takes a toll on everybody. Because as I said earlier, with common core state standards, the, the need for, to, for students to, to have more rigor and reach mastery, how do we do this if we don't have the staffing and the resources that we need? So you, you're, you are correct, we do need to, and I will take help from anywhere. If I'm going in the wrong direction with what I think I need, I'll take direction um, on where we can tweak. Um, I did visit some other schools. Um, we are looking at working with the AEF. We want to work on restructuring the middle school. We want to take a large school and make it feel small. We want to make sure that our students are getting the most individual experience that they can get. So I went to visit um, Middleton Middle School, Higgins Middle School in Peabody, and McCall Middle School in Winchester. They're roughly the same size. McCall's a little bit bigger. Their numbers are dropping, I believe the principal said. Um, Higgins is the largest in the state. They're at 1,300 right now, but their numbers are dropping every year. And our numbers are going to be at about 1,300 in about four years. Mm -hmm. So pretty soon, we are going to be one of, if not the biggest middle school in the state of Massachusetts. Now, I went there, and I thought to myself, we do very well. <laughs> they were asking me, what do you do in tech education? We don't do that. What are your science teachers doing with the common core? We don't do that. What, what is your, what your orchestra is playing in a classroom and you're still invited every year? We've never been invited to that performance in Boston at the Seaport Hotel. And you guys have won it how many times? Your chorus has been invited, your orchestra has been invited, your, your band does this. We've never, we haven't done those things. And these are people with, with far more resources. So we are doing what um, Leva said earlier, we outperform our resources. And I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind, I'm going to use that a lot. And I did write down your question um, well, for, for later. Mm -hmm. So and I, I, mm -hmm. I would have to think about that mm -hmm. a lot. But um, so I think the first thing we have to do is next to grade seven and eight on the, the handout that I gave you, cross out cluster. Um, there was a lot of back and forth today with Marie, Karen, and myself. And for some reason, the word cluster got in there. So we're not looking to add a cluster for 7 8, although I would like to. Um, we talked about adding a cluster to grade 6. But then we backed up a little bit and said, all right, we have needs in a lot of different places. So you don't want to draft four pitchers if we also need third baseman and mm -hmm. outfield. So we need to spread the wealth a little bit. So we thought, let's back up a little bit and, and look for a half cluster in six that might go through and move up with the bubble class. Because eventually the class is going to start to level off and also reduce. And again, when I went to visit at McCall, they do do that at McCall. They move the half cluster. So it's a social studies English teacher and a math science teacher. So a humanities teacher and a math science teacher. So we have to look for people that are certified in those areas. We do have some people that are certified. And what McCall does is they move them to the bubble classes or the bigger classes. So those teachers were hired with the expectation that they would move on a regular basis. Um, some teachers are excited about being able to do that. Um, so that's where what we're looking to do so that this, the, that half cluster would move through. Um, right now, our grade six class is 360, 370. That's 366 to 370. Uh, it will be 405 next year. So that 370 will go up to grade seven, and then grade eight will be 382. Our average class size right now is roughly 26 to 28 students. Uh, I will have a better breakdown for Dr. Ampey uh, as well. Uh, and I will, uh, try, I will do it by grade. Um, I will do it by subject, and, and I will break down the math classes, advanced and, uh, and standard level classes. Um, so that, that would be our need for, for the clusters. Also, our science classes too, and 
Larry will tell you this as well. Our science classes at the middle school are very large, and we also have labs in seven and eight, and our class sizes in, in <coughs> science at seven and eight are large as well, and we are out of compliance there. Um, our outer cluster needs are begging for attention as well. So our clusters, our cluster classes, because we, we do want to stay with the middle school model. We're committed to staying with the middle school model. We're, we're looking at uh, some restructuring ideas that I would love to talk to you about at a different time, but this is about <clears throat> our budget priorities. So if we look at foreign language, we had to, four years ago, go to the, the, the we changed the grade six model to the exploratory. A lot of parents feel strongly that they would like their students to come in and get three solid years of a foreign language. Um, the exploratory they like for some reasons, where you get exposed to a, a lot of different foreign languages, you get exposed to culture, but you know, parents still feel strongly that they would like their students to get a, um, a solid experience of three years of a foreign language. To do that, we would need <coughs> at least one more FTE for foreign language. If we want to get back to where we were before, we need at least 1.2, if not 1.5 uh, FTEs in foreign language in, in order to really bring the complement back to where it was. But, that, but the 1.0 would be a must, especially with, the, with class sizes right now bursting at the seams in foreign language. And again, Catherine, you can feel free to jump in at any time with that. But um, I think that that would be what we would need to do in order to bring it back to where it was. And it's really wonderful to have Mandarin this year, uh, and we're hoping to increase that as well uh, next year, which Catherine can talk to you about. Um, we did a, we worked very hard at uh, Maureen Murphy, who's at the middle school in Jackson. Mr. Flood's been bouncing back and forth between the concert and, and here. Well, actually, it's a town hall, right? Town hall. So Ms. Murphy's at town hall right now. She says she's sorry that she couldn't be here. She worked really hard with us on the schedule last year because we had too many directed studies. So what we were able to do was take that eighth period directed study um, where band, chorus, and orchestra were, perform were practicing and build that and get rid of that class and have band, chorus, and orchestra able to work during the first period. That took months alone. That took months to do because it's, it, it's so tight right now that um, it, it was really, uh, it was, took a tremendous amount of effort for her to be able to do that. So what we're looking at right now is we, we either need to increase the amount of 0.5 FTEs at, at the specialty levels, or we need to stretch out when students are allowed to take specialty classes so they would get less exposure to the specialty classes. So we'd have to go to a six-day rotation instead of a four-day rotation and they would take a certain specialty on AB day, another specialty on CD day, and another specialty on EF day. Now, the problem with that is when they're not in those classes, they're in a study. So we've done, we've reduced our, our studies, and this would be very unfortunate because the reduction of studies has helped reduce downtime for students, uh, which has uh, shown a drastic reduction in discipline issues. We've had it, we went through this the other day, the assistant principals, uh, Ms. Regan, and guidance counselors got together and we talked about it. We went on power school and we looked at the, the last few years when we had that eighth period and the other directed studies in the building. And then this year, when we don't, to, from the beginning of the year to December on those years, we had far more discipline referrals than we did this year. So the fact that there's more time on learning has reduced the discipline, which is a huge, thing for us, and we'd hate to go back to having more studies in the building, because the studies that we do have, um, that we would have to have, would resemble Old Hall, and as you heard Dr. Janger earlier saying that he wanted to go away from having Old Hall as much as he can. Now, we haven't been able to eradicate studies altogether, there are schools that have been able to do that, I'd love to be one of them, but I want to get away from that Old Hall feel. We should never have something like that at the middle school. So in order to remain, to maintain the reduced studies and minimum, and maintain the class size, not minimum, but maintain the large class size that we already have, we would need 
um, 0.5 facts, 0.5 art, 0.5 music, a 0.5 ELL teacher, and then the 0.5 social worker is in there because of the larger number of students that come in, we have the larger number of students with social work needs, anxiety, depression, and we had, actually had a presentation here um, yesterday afternoon, it was a wonderful presentation on how to deal with students with behavioral issues, anxiety, depression, and other mental health uh, situations that they have to deal with. So the larger population begs for more, more social work. We also need a 0.5 tech engineering. And the reason I um, left that for last is because that one we really need because the class sizes are putting us out of uh, our, the regulations for safety, we're breaking the regulations for safety. We also have some special education needs. Um, what happens in the, in the middle school is that the cluster, we, we do have a cluster system or a team system where one team member would need to go to a team meeting for a student that's on an IEP. So what happens is, is with reduced permanent subs, or building, uh, not permanent subs, but building <coughs> subs, uh, we need to uh, have a, a, an additional building sub to cover just the special education meetings. Because Mr. Flood is constantly trying to scramble to get, if he has 15, 16 teachers out on a given day for professional development, personal days, sick days, or whatever, he has to cover those, but then there's also five or six IEP meetings, and he has to cover those as well. Well, it's finite. You know, we try to do the best we can, but then the teachers are late for the IEP meetings because we're trying to get coverage, and, and it's just impossible. So if we had this additional building sub, it would, it would really help us to cover those meetings so that we could run the, the, the IEP meetings more smoothly. Um, and Mr. Help, that you could feel free to chime yeah. in on that, as well as the additional SLC teacher. Yeah, no, so one thing that's really become important and has really worked really well this year is that we've been working to build the capacity within the general ed to work with our special ed population. So working smarter, not harder. The idea is what's, what's happening is when we have these team meetings and the general ed teachers are not really a part of it, we're losing that ability to transfer that knowledge into the clusters and getting those teachers to build the capacity to work with our tougher students. So without an ability to really work and team plan with them, we're not really supporting our students to the best of our abilities. Um, in addition, we are seeing a huge increase in the emotional and anxiety populations within the school. And what's happening uh, with that is that we're having a hard time addressing them. Uh, just from our learning team data, last year, out of 54 students who were brought to learning team, 44% of them had emotional needs. Most of those were hospitalized. Um, this year alone, out of 16 students, 63 of them came as a referral for emotional needs. These populations are there now, and they're only getting worse. And what's happening is we need a way to really address those needs in a more <laughs> systemic way. And this SLC feature would allow for us to really have that combined effect of really reaching out into those clusters and getting the work that needs to get done into the in where the students are, as opposed to pulling them out and really thinking about how we are branching out and working with those students where they are right now. Thank you. So moving from the staffing needs, uh, we do have other needs in the building. I know that the emphasis needs to be on the high school uh, due to the NEASH report and the fact that the high school has really gone unattended for a long time and been very gracious about that where other schools are being built. Uh, and the middle school has had newer construction than the high school as well. We, we do have some uh, construction needs and as well as some security needs. Um, due to the events of, of last week, um, the, there, there were people that, that brought to our attention that we do need more cameras around the, the middle school. Mm -hmm. uh, the Benjamin uh, Road door uh, needs a camera, <laughs> I would say. The, uh, where the blue gym is in the back of the school, it would be helpful to have a camera there, as well as a swipe card system mm -hmm. that the high school has. I think that would be very beneficial for us, uh, really in the face of everything that's been happening. Um, so uh, that's something that we, we would like to discuss. 
As far as construction needs, uh, with, the, um, with the enrollment going up, we're going to need to divide classrooms. So there are five, four or five classrooms in the, in the middle school that are very large that we could divide. And we could make, turn those four or five classrooms into eight or nine classrooms. So we need to have construction done there. Um, teachers are going to be traveling. Uh, they're going to be moving more uh, as far as uh, having your own classroom. We want to do that as much as we can, but the teachers are going to travel more. So we want to be able to build some workspaces for the teachers as well. So that would be uh, construction needs there. Uh, we also will be moving the assistant principals to uh, be in the wings with, the, um, their, with their classes. So now that we have three assistant principals um, to personalize education more, we want the administration to be on the wing with their, their classes. So that's something that we, have to, we might have to do some minor construction there. This will also help with the personalization. Um, the uh, modulus could be something that we would look into at a later date. I think when we get, when the school gets to be about 1,300, we're going to be way past capacity and we, we may need to look at that. The lunchroom, right now, we have three lunches. If we're going to stay at three lunches, we are already at capacity for the three lunches. With the class coming in at 4.05, that may push us to have to add a fourth lunch. It doesn't sound like a big deal. Um, I was in Peabody, where they have 1,300 students. They have five lunches. So that, that's crazy. Students are going down to lunch at 10.15, 10.30 in the morning. So they have breakfast at 7 o'clock, 7.30. They're having lunch three hours later. And then by 1 o'clock, they're hungry again mm -hmm. before they've even left school. So, and there's no snack time, unfortunately, in middle school. We could all <laughs> use a little snack time. But um, so this is, this is something that, that is a, a big need as well. So I was talking to Dr. Bodie earlier, and she was stating that that is something that could really affect the schedule uh, in a major way. We'd have to redo the whole schedule. So it sounds like a small thing, but it really isn't. And as far as school material needs, <coughs> we have the math curriculum for grades six and seven, and we would need to purchase the math curriculum for grade eight. Matt, would you like to say anything about that? Or um, yeah, we just complete off what we had essentially done. Um, if you can, do you guys want the, the numbers, um, or class sizes, I can tell them to you right now. The average sixth grade class is 26. You want to come up here? And oh, yeah, yeah, please do. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, average class size for a sixth grade class is about 26. In seventh grade, the advanced class is roughly 30 to 31. Um, the highest is 37, lowest is 25. For the regular, uh, most of the classes are 22. Uh, highest there is 26, and the lowest is uh, 16. And for the eighth grade, uh, those class sizes, because of the fact that the overall class is a little bit smaller, are much more manageable. The advanced classes are, you know, a good 25, 26, and that's roughly what the, the lower ones were. Right now, you know, seventh grade is the pinch, because that's essentially where you go from uh, heterogeneous grouping to then choosing. Um, and right now, you, just the way in which it's, it's set, in terms of making a choice, sometimes it's a little, little tough. So the class sizes are, are getting big. They're, they're getting real big at that point. Um, I could even tell you the high school numbers if you want a sense of that, too. Sure. All right. Um, so in the high school, the average size of the, the honor slash AP for high school math is about 30. Uh, the average size for the, um, and I'll give you the range for curriculum A, because that's a little bit more. For curriculum A, it's about 24 to 27. Uh, and then for curriculum B classes, we were able to get them to about 16 or 17. In past years, those were usually around 24, uh, which really didn't suit that population all that well. Um, so, you know, in terms of moving things around, it's, it's what we're trying to get to uh, and trying to make it a little bit more manageable. But uh, in terms of the overall staffing, it is a, a little bit of a pinch at, at all grades for math. Thanks. I, I hope we didn't leave any of the other department chairs out, so uh, if Catherine would like to come up and talk about that as well. And then the other <coughs> department chairs as well. I thought I'd just expand okay. um, a little bit on the World Language Exploratory Program. So um, right now we have 285 students in the exploratory with 12 sections, so we have an average of 24 kids per class, and I think it's interesting that there are 370 students in the sixth grade, so we're not 
servicing a lot of them. Um, and honestly, when we enrolled students last spring and I saw the numbers, I started panicking because I was like, there's 35 kids in each class. And uh, anyone who knows me know that I want every single student in world language. And I called up Tim and was like, we, we can't service as many kids. They need to be put, put somewhere else. Um, so there, and thinking about 405 kids coming in next year is, there's just, it's not sustainable. The exploratory program, I think, um, to quote Tim's words, um, we're making it work. Um, I'm actually teaching uh, two sections of the exploratory this year, um, and I'm a dual language certified teacher in French and Spanish, which is a hard person to find, and we certainly can't find triple language certified or quadruple language certified now that we have Mandarin. Um, we, by chance, have a multilingual teacher who's doing the bulk of the sixth grade sections, who's certified in French and Spanish, can do Latin, and has been studying Mandarin for three years by a short miracle, really. Um, so she's picking up the bulk of the exploratory, but I, I just think it's not sustainable, and we do want to return, ideally, to a full um, you know, three years of um, language in the middle school, and you know, I, I really thank Tim for crunching these numbers because there there is a significant need there. Um, so, are there? I guess we'll hold questions for the end. I think we're, we're so we're asking for six full time, and I think if you have any questions, um, this would be. I get. This. We're all here, so <laughs> yeah. Let me go around the same way. Um, okay. Okay. I, would, I would like to add something if you don't oh, want to talk. Please. I appreciate Matt for providing those numbers, which are basically the same across all disciplines at the middle school level because um, of the cluster system. Just the qualitative experience as somebody who's frequently sitting in an observer in our middle school classrooms, especially in the younger grades, it's like looking at a picture of a beehive where all the bees are fighting to get um, into the same little crevice at the end of class in a sixth grade classroom when um, the bell rings and every kid has an individual question to ask the teacher. Um, they're literally almost crawling over one another um, to get the teacher's attention and to ask that one last question before they have to go off to their next class. It's really something to behold and speaks to how every kid needs individual attention and how hard it is to give that individual attention in a large classroom. The other piece here is curricular, where with the Common Core um, classes, that content area courses that used to be um, not literacy focused now are, and the grading load um, is tremendous. Um, and I'm constantly pushing my teachers to do more writing instruction and reading instruction. Um, so if I see a wonderful project, Julie, um, my next question is like, well, what are the, how do the students research? Um, can you show me what they wrote about it? Um, and um, you know, there's been a transition there, but the take-home work of the teacher has grown tremendously, um, and the expectations of every content area teacher has grown tremendously as a result, not just of the Common Core, but the last five years um, of um, transitions in education in general. So increased the amount of writing mm -hmm. down. Ten kids or 105 kids in the class of 235, 140. That's adding about three <coughs> hours of correction to a teacher. And even in an era of rubrics, nothing beats personalized feedback in improving a student's writing. And it's hard to give that personalized feedback um, with n numbers that are through the roof. Mm -hmm. What you sense? Let's go back to the original request in terms of cluster. Um, you were talking about adding a half cluster at the sixth grade level and then having that half cluster coming up. Um, even when we did hear about the seventh grade class sizes, um, is there actually a need for additional staffing at that level? And the, I, because part of me thought about with the subject specialization that the Common Core really seems to be driving, whether whether we might be in a better position in terms of what we provide to students to have a full cluster that is doing half sixth grade and half seventh, people <coughs> are content certified for both. Um, it would be well. Can I give you two scenarios? Yeah. All right. So my first scenario would be. The numbers are going to 
level off at some point, but we're going to have, we're having four or five come in and then the next class is bigger and the next class is bigger and the next class is a little bit bigger. So it, ideally, it would be wonderful to have a sixth grade cluster. I mean, again, I know it's Christmas and I can only ask for certain things <laughs> in my house and I'm, I'm trying to be good and not ask for too much. But ideally, it would be great to have a cluster in sixth grade that would be welcoming, you know, we're trying to personalize. We're trying to work on transitions. We want the transition from fifth to sixth to be as smooth as possible. And again, it's like getting rid of the directed studies. I think we've done an outstanding job at, at making it a better transition. Now we're working on the transition from eight to nine, as well as still about fifth to sixth. But I think we've done a really good job uh, at, in, at having a smoother transition. I have more and more parents uh, letting me know that the transition has been very smooth, and we're very proud of that. Um, and then having the seventh and eighth grade split cluster. So taking those extra 60 kids that are in seven and eight and having the, the split cluster do half seven and half eight. That would be eight teachers right there. So that's a lot. Uh, and then the other scenario would be backing off a little bit, we'd be having the split class would be six and seven. And then but what we decided would be feasible right now to ask for and you know graciously ask for and it would be a half cluster for grade six. So okay, you realize in order to do our job well, we can't give you everything you ask for. I know. Mm -hmm. So in being a little bit modest. Um, it, and as somebody that is, has one finishing up her time at the office and then had somebody there right when, right before the ten positions were cut, um, there definitely has been a difference with that that um, smaller classes as they enter and go to a full rotation and see mm -hmm. what it's meant for the instructional quality. Um, because the children are so much more needy at the sixth grade level. And go, it would be nice to, to have that continuum of the personalization back <coughs> at the middle school because it is a very large building for younger children. But, um, you know, I don't want to give away the farm, but I, I really want to see us do what is educationally appropriate and this is true. Andrew said, pretty much invest in the programs that right up in the front keep us from doing more expensive programs later on because middle school is the point where we have the first equalization in terms of the content and, and it really does become very content driven and it seems like there is more special identification at middle school, at school level as a result. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'd like to see you do that same comparison mm -hmm. of when we personalize it, when we reduce our student to teacher ratio, here's what we expect to see in terms of other states. I'd rather see it done right the first time than us having to do RCI and special ed and everything later on. And These are discussions we have every Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, I, and just, I'm a, an English teacher, so I often speak in analogy and simply and it drives some people crazy. But it's the, the, the simile of it, it's like a, a blanket that's too small. So if you pull the blanket up to cover your shoulders and neck, your legs and feet are cold. If you pull the blanket down to cover your legs and feet, then your chest, shoulders, and neck are cold. So it's just how can you sleep better? Can you sleep better with your legs cold or your shoulders and neck cold? And you just have to decide. My answer is they're children, they should be able to sleep well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it's been an enlightening discussion today, and I want all the principals to know through this discussion that, uh, you know, I, I, I understand the competing needs and, and, and the pressures that are on, especially uh, in the context of the increased enrollment in the district. Uh, and, and I also understand what happened to the reductions because I was on this committee from 01 to 07 in the local aid, the 20% local aid cut happened in 2004, which is the big event that we haven't recovered from. Uh, so I know what we went through. Um, uh, 
Uh, also, rem uh, remind your children that your their father works for the Arlington Public Schools, so that that does restrict your <laughs> uh, Christmas list, um, which, which is what we're doing here as well, is restricting the Christmas list because we don't have an unlimited amount of money. Uh, and you're talking about future uh, enrollment increases, whereas the elementaries have already been really hit with enrollment increases. And there's not a lot of give or play within an elementary schedule. Uh, so the first question that I have for you is, as you're looking to restructure the school, are there ways to make your schedule more efficient to provide more services for children with the current level of staffing? Well, we did that this year mm -hmm. uh, by reducing the schedule to the seven periods mm -hmm. and really tightening it up and looking at our, all of our different programs and being able to coordinate uh, the math support classes so that we're able to work with the schedule so that we could have more students identified early before mm -hmm. the year starts. We have more students now scheduled in math support than ever before. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is is because we looked at how we were scheduling students mm -hmm. and so we, we did the schedule different so mm -hmm. we could get more students that needed math support. So we identified them earlier and got them in there. Um, again, working with special education to identify those needs and working with the schedule for that. So I think continuing to do that so that we can identify students with emotional needs, mm -hmm. uh, anxiety needs, because these are, these are the things that we need to do in order to, to keep, to, to have them have a more successful experience. So yeah, I understand, understand that we're going to the Finance Committee with an argument that says, we've got an increased enrollment, and the reason why we need more resources in addition to what is in the current fiscal plan is because of the increase in enrollment. And so that if we do get additional resources in the district beyond the inflationary number of the fiscal plan, they are basically going to be directed at the schools and the grade levels where there are demonstrated uh, enrollment increases. Uh, so that's we're not we're not having we don't have a lot of Christmas wish right. room here. So what what you're asking too, I think, is you're going to be able to give us what. You're going to be able to give us, mm -hmm. and then we're still going to be have to. We're going to still have to be creative after that. Mm -hmm. We're still going to, we're going to have to take risks. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to be creative, and we're going to have to look at mm -hmm. what we will do with the schedule. So, mm -hmm. when we know what we're going to be able, what our final, what you're going to be able to say, okay, this is what you have. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to have to go back to the drawing board at that point and say, all right, what risks do we need to take? How creative do we need to be? What are the changes that we're going to need to do with the schedule? So these are things. That unless we know mm -hmm. what you're going to be able to give us, we don't know really what our schedule is going to look like. So, can we be creative? Mm -hmm. it, it will be tougher, um, but we're going to have to be. Uh, are we? We're going to have to look at being creative with space. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have to be looking, look, being creative about where teachers mm -hmm. are during the day, or how they travel, um, and. Where and how we structure the schedule so that the students are in all the classes that they need to be in. So, yeah, a couple, uh, two other things that I'd like to ask. Number one is that last year when we went through the superintendent's goals, we targeted uh, student growth and achievement measures for the superintendent. And the place, one of the places was challenging were in a couple of grade levels, the Odyssey. And I've noticed there's been some marked increase in student achievement results this year vis-a-vis -vis past years. Uh, persuasive argument in my mind will be what resources are important to continue to improve student achievement numbers and grades where it is traditionally lagged. Well, if you look at seventh grade math, or that's one area, so one of our goals for this year is to increase the rigor in math mm -hmm. for student achievement based on the common course. Uh, state standards. Mm -hmm. so that's one of my goals for this year, mm -hmm. um, to continue to, to push mm -hmm. that. So math is always going to be a goal mm -hmm. for me, so that's one, one of my goals. And again, in order to increase student achievement, personalization is another one of the goals that I have in my, in my school improvement plan for this year. Mm -hmm. So by being able to restructure and personalize by creating different programs 
Um, I, I don't want to get into them right now because mm -hmm. I'm still discussing uh, mm -hmm. some programs with my staff and my leadership team. Um, but there are different ways that we're going about working with my school improvement plan uh, to do that. So, you know, we are, we are continuing to say, this is what we did last year. All right, we know we had an increase. What's the next step? This is the next step that we have to do in order to continue to increase students here. I mean, uh, tying budgetary requests to uh, an improvement plan and demonstrating needs is probably the most persu persuasive argument you can make. Uh, certain things that in terms of discussion, if you go to a finance committee and say, that, uh, if, if you don't give us more money, class size is going to go, and the average class size is going to go from 23.8 to 24.1, you know, eyes will blaze over and say, mm -hmm, you know, but, uh, you know, but let me tell you something, 37 looks good on my car spec, but uh, when I heard the class size of 37 in the high school, I want to know how that happened in the line. You mean the 37? Well, Matt, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, um, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think one of the things that um, we always have to make a decision about is um, typical feature of the cluster mm -hmm. is about class. Mm -hmm. So in past years, mm -hmm. uh, I would say that the overall percentage of the way in which it was distributed was probably closer to 70% advanced, 30% uh, not advanced uh, in the regular mainstream mm -hmm. class. So those numbers divide much easier by five, because mm -hmm. you can take three and two, mm -hmm. and they become much more balanced. So this year it's closer to about 60, 63%, mm -hmm. and you know, the remainder. So how do you divide that by five? Um, and one of the tough things is you make a choice. So do you want your advanced kids to be um, in a class of 22, 23? If you divide those advanced, the whatever percentage is 60% by three, then you talk about the 20% that's around 20 something kids. But that in turn forces the other classes, the other two mainstream classes, to be around 28. So um, the initial numbers when they came out, coupled with the fact that parents always have the ability to override and move up. Mm -hmm. So we had a nice healthy balance going in with the numbers that we felt good about. But then if you set with those class number sizes and then allow there to change, mm -hmm. which happens, then you end up with that one section that ends up with 37. So unless you're doing whole scale changes after the fact, um, I mean, that, that, that's, it, 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 unfortunately that in that one class it was just a, a perfect storm of a couple of, of little events. Is this a function of being in clusters and then maybe we should be looking at the cluster model if we don't have the flexibility to adjust? That's, that's, yes, that's something else that we, we may have to look at again depending on what we're able to, what you're able to do for us, we may have to, that may be part of the restructuring. Uh, so that's always something that we have to look at. We, and I did talk to Dr. Bodie about that very thing today, which I haven't been able to discuss it with uh, Mr. Coleman yet, so I don't think it's fair to say it without talking to, to him. So it's a conversation that I want to have. So. I mean, it comes to the point where you say clusters are nice, but if you've got such an imbalance, if you've got well, what are the other class sizes for the, the, the upper level math that uh, grade on? <coughs> well, they're only the seven, 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 seven and eight uh, have the upper level, six dozen. So, okay. So, the class sizes for grade eight, you mean? No, no, for, for you know, the, the 37 is in the upper level class, the grade seven class, right? How many upper level grade seven sections do we have in the building? Uh, six. And what are the class sizes across the board? Low is 25, the highest 37, with an average of 30. Okay, uh, so you've got one class of 25 and one class of 37, yep. and the reason for that is because you're maintaining the field they do with a cluster scale, uh, plan, right? Uh, uh, part of it. We allow yeah, those parents to move their students. Yeah, um, I, just my priority looking at it is that uh, reasonable class sizes are more important than keeping in clusters. Uh, I, I, I've got somebody in the back of the room shaking their head. No, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think that we, we've got to think about what's happening if, if we're locked into a point where we're getting 37 chances. Mr. Schlossman, we heard about Carpenter. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my two colleagues. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, 
Let's see. I just want to. I want to. I'm going to. I want to get a clarification about FTEs that you're asking for. Then I'm going to ask a question. So. <coughs> Half cluster in the sixth grade plus the three or four FTEs in the on the on the uh, spe in terms of specialists. So how many how many FTEs are you asking for? Today? So it'd be. I, mean, I realize this is an informal ask, but how many are you hoping? Well, I may have stuck an extra one in there, but um, yeah, so my, my math came up with seven. Social work that would be one. Odd news would be two. And tech and facts would be three, and then the half class would be five. So it's eight. So, uh, so it's five. Eight. 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 Well, the half, the two, the tech, is, the tech and facts is one. Yeah. Art and music is two. EL and social work are three. Mm -hmm. SLC would be four. And then the half class would be five and six. Oh, so six total. So six. Oh, six. Language? No, oh, language. Oh, and language would be seven. Okay. Yes, Building seven. sub? What's that? No, that doesn't count. It's not a teacher. It doesn't okay. count as a teacher. That doesn't count okay. as a teacher. So I missed the I missed the foreign language. <laughs> so, so, okay. So I I was I was going to make the point that Paul made, uh, but I just I think it bears repeating is that we have we every year we set goals for the superintendent, and so um, so I suspect the priority is going to come from the superintendent's view, and that is that. Um, in terms of the FTEs that are added next year, it, it's it's got to show that it's going to that it's going to drive student achievement. I mean, it's that simple. So I think when you're when you're putting together the priority list, you're putting together the actual presentation to the school committee about the budget for FY15. It's got to show these FTEs are going to ensure that we're getting an SGP of 51 or better. And all of our it's it's going it's to show that we, you know it's, it's got to meet the, the targets of the superintendent that we have for the superintendent schools, and so that's the that's what I would encourage you to think about. I suspect you already have been thinking about this. I'm sure you have. Yeah, but, the super, yeah, the superintendent has talked to all of us about it. the superintendent's goals and the district goals are tied into our goals, which mm -hmm. go into our school improvement plans, which are tied into our staff needs, uh, and it's all based on student achievement. So my three. School improvement goals, which are a math goal, a common course state standards goal, and then my personalization goal, all have to do with the staff that I need, which will increase student achievement. So, so you need, so you need the seven FTEs to meet the goals. It would, yeah. Make no, I mean, it's fair enough. Fair enough. It would, okay. It would help me. And I think that I think that needs to be said clearly and loudly to to as many constituents as possible. I mean, this is it. You know, we've made this a priority. We've made we've made improvement in middle school math and uh, middle school subgroups is a priority. And so to do it, we need 7.0 FTEs, and that's what you have to and, and that is my goal, my math goal this year is the middle school subgroups. Yeah. So to do it, it's 7.0, so, yeah, okay. And we appreciate the extra math support from last year. We have, I haven't forgotten that. That's been tremendously helpful. So, thank you. Um, I just want to thank everybody for all the effort and pulling all this together for us. Um, we are, uh, as the budget chair, I do want you to know that we have gone in front of the town. We are uh, making them aware of the enrollment pressures that are being put on the schools um, and asking for additional funds uh, to help us out with that. So I think all of this really helps us a lot when we have actual hard numbers we can go to them with and say, you know, the enrollment pressures are such that these are the minimum FTEs that we need just to be able to serve the kids that are in the schools. Um, and so I just really want to thank everybody for all of that because I think it really helps us as we continue those discussions. Um, and I just want you to know that they are going forward and um, we're not just sitting here going, you know, we can have to make do with what we have because we realize that we are currently uh, serving you know, everyone is used to Arlington being 4,500 students, and we are at 5,200. Um, and we need to keep telling people that. We need to keep saying it out loud and not letting people, you know, just rest on the fact that we, we can't serve that many more hundreds of students with the same amount of money that we've always been dealing with. Um, and so I just want to say this is great, um, and this is much very useful. So um, I appreciate all the effort. I know that was a lot of work to get all of those things done, so thanks. Yeah, it's gonna be a, a combination of what we're able to, to have and then 
of being able to take the correct risks mm -hmm. and, and the correct, the correct amount of creativity. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, dividing up the classrooms, how much, how many more students do you figure that would allow for before you start thinking about portables or? I'd have to do some more work on the numbers uh, before I can say. Um, we're still, I, we, we, I guess it's like we need to know what we're gonna get for teachers. Then we'll know exactly what we need to do as far as dividing the rooms up. And then, then we'll be able to determine how many students would be in each of the rooms. I appreciate it might be a, a chicken and an egg. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sharing the facilities, I think I can support the teacher if I had an idea of how many students as opposed to having walk by and portables and stuff like that, I realize it's a short-term fix. Uh, so and I would ask you if you could, not, not major um, priority. I would say a ballpark figure, it would it would house us for three more years. <laughs> Thank you. So, and then I, won't, I won't hold you to that exactly, that, but, but I, I'll, I'll tell you what, something important for us to I'll tell you what, I want to be here three years from now <laughs> to, to, to say, we're good, we don't need any uh, modulus, but hopefully uh, we won't put it. Thank that you. Means, you know, that could be challenging. Thank you. And, and thank you very much. I want to echo what, what Cindy just said. Um, the presentation was very, very insightful for us. We heard from uh, Dr. Jenger about the technology needs at the high school. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a little bit about what the bandwidth is, what the, what the infrastructure is like, what the facilities uh, you have for technology? Um, what um, the Audison has the oldest uh, wireless network out of any of the schools because it was the first wireless network that was put in. I had an update meeting with um, the tech committee today and a lot of the problems that we're experiencing at the Audison is because it was the first network and the technology has changed dramatically. If it was just a matter of time or money, we could solve all the technical problems. They have a lot of problems with their wireless. Um, part of it is the structure of the building, but part of it is the years that the technology was put in. Um, so they have actually have more infrastructure problems than the high school does because of the timing of what I know I see you're rolling your eyes but the t because of what the timing of when the um, Wi-Fi was installed um, in terms of what their other technological needs are um, most of the teachers are in pretty good shape there are a few teachers that that are not um, but uh, in terms of the students, um, we're running some pilots right now to determine what would be the best technological solution for them. Well, I want to thank also um, Tim and his staff for working on this. Um, I, I want to just point out a couple of things. Um, because like the high school, we have teachers that are working very hard. Mm -hmm. The effort to personalize and to give students the attention is um, something the middle school prides themselves on, and they do a, a pretty good, very good job of doing that, despite the class sizes. But we're, we're looking at teachers, even though they have a, a, a cluster that is fairly, um, uh, fairly, it's fairly large, probably a lot of the clusters are about 130. That's a lot of students to be responsible for and the correcting and so forth. And when you, when you visit middle school classrooms, when you have a complement of 30 students in that classroom, mm -hmm. it feels tight. Mm -hmm. it's n there's not a lot of extra space. And these classrooms um, would be, were designed mm -hmm. in, at the time that the, it was renovated in that 22 to 24 was considered a high number. Mm -hmm. So when you get that number of students in classroom, it's, it's just, First of all, the, the ventilation isn't good, mm -hmm. the, the, and mm -hmm. the, just the sense of being able to move around. And there's not a lot of open space to take a class if you want to, to do um, uh, different kinds of projects that require more space. So it, it's a compliment to the teachers that they just are, are very, um, very creative about what they do there, and they get, are getting very good results as a result. And so I think that's really important to, to say because they're facing some of the same issues that we're facing here in terms of uh, the class sizes. As I said, over the last few years when we've had, we've been building back, the secondary level really hasn't mm -hmm. had the attention 
Um, not that we haven't been aware of it, but we've been making do. Mm -hmm. And I think we're past the making do stage of this, and we really do, in this budget cycle, have to put some real attention. But as you know from the elementary principals, as, uh, listening to their needs, um, there are lots of um, staffing needs throughout the entire district. Um, but what we see at the secondary, um, more than we see at the elementary, <coughs> is staffing needs in all of our academic subject areas. Of course, at the middle school, mm -hmm. they need extra staffing in all the specials mm -hmm. because these class sizes are running very large. Mm -hmm. uh, the class sizes in the PE are in the 30s. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation for all involved. As far as your question as to when we would need portables, mm -hmm. one of the things we are looking very closely at is how we can redivide, re what programs maybe we could take out of the middle school. There's one possibly that we're going to be working on doing, which might free up two classrooms. We're looking to see how we can um, create spaces that match the size of the classrooms. Because we do have a couple of special ed classrooms which are larger than what, what they need. So it's, it's re-looking at all of that and seeing how we can do that. But but when you talk about adding a cluster, mm -hmm. that's four classrooms that have to house 25 minimum mm -hmm. students. And that is going to be the challenge. Uh, three years may be optimistic if these numbers continue. Um, I think we could get close to three. We <laughs> hope we can get to three. But um, it's going to take a lot of you know, some construction, really, in terms of how, and, and, and changes in the schedule, and maybe some changes in expectations in terms of mm -hmm. um, interim um, teachers moving from class, mm -hmm. different classrooms, and that may happen more, um, more sharing of spaces, and use, utilizing a classroom for all periods of the day. So there are a lot of things that we're going to be looking at um, short of having to finally do that. And as you know, there's, there's three major um, still building facility needs that are out there. And of course, one is addressing Odison in terms of space. We, we are committed as a community to, to completing um, the update of Stratton. And then this facility speaks for itself. I think those of you that toured, you know, you've heard about the facility, but I think, you know, pictures are a thousand words. And, uh, we're going to be looking at different ways to educate the community in the next, um, over this next few months, about a little bit more about the conditions here. So they have a lot of challenges uh, in terms of space and trying to do it. S scheduling, <coughs> middle school is the hardest <coughs> level to schedule, bar none. It's so difficult to put all the pieces together. And that's actually one of the things that sort of contributes a little bit too to how some class sizes can get. Um, uneven. But Tim is absolutely correct. The amount of time that was spent on getting the schedule to that place this year was enormous and there's a, a major push this year to get the schedule even done earlier so more tweaking can be done over the summer. So there are a lot of needs and if you just put the high school and the middle school together just and these are not these are sort of the minimum <coughs> conservative. You're looking at a seven in the middle school. Mm -hmm. And you're looking in the range of four to six. So right away, we're, we're looking, say we had six at the high school. We're looking at 13 FTEs. And that's, a, that's, that's in addition to all of the other needs that you're, I know you're very aware of. So they, everyone fully aware, is aware that if we are not able to fund those, and that's some of our discussion over the next uh, month, that we're going to really have to prioritize what are the most important at the at not only within a building but within a district, and that's the discussions we will be having as a administrative team um, shortly. Thank you very, very, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Yeah, everyone out there, come up and speak as well. Thank you. Yes, we have all of our. You can see all of our uh, department chairs mm -hmm. here. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, moving on now to uh, <laughs> monthly financial report. Mm -hmm.
Uh, because of some of the timing last month, we received the. Uh, forgive my voice. I can hear you, so can we wait till then? Yeah, well, you know, I know she's hurting, so I don't want to. You're hurting the, the, you know, the voices of all three of us. I know. All right, um, forgive my, uh, my froggy voice. I'm. Uh, try to <clears throat> be as clear as I can. Um, due to the timing of the monthly reports last month, there's really only been one payroll between the last set of monthly reports and these monthly reports. So nothing is substantively changed from last month. Mm -hmm. Very cute to that, I promise. And I want to thank you for the extra reports that you sent us this time. Uh, mm -hmm. If I could ask you, just take a look at the revolving expenses, uh, the one you gave us. Uh, just basically under the foreign visas, it was a $10,000 thing on credit card charges. Yes, that's the fee that we pay to the credit card company for handling our credit cards. And that is defrayed by people that are, when they, uh, when they elect to pay a fee by credit card, there's a surcharge on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But and so out of that, we, we as a district, we have to pay the charge to the credit card company. Oh. And so we pass it back to the employees, but we aggregate the charges in this account. Under the foreign visa account? We just, that's just a place to put okay. the expense. And one more, I'm sorry. I just, <coughs> up above that, under the athletic ticket sales, mm -hmm. there were two, uh, two items that had no budgeted. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I don't break out a budget line for each of the subcategories within the revolving account. Okay. Because the way the revenues come in, it would, it would be a lot of bean counting. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any, any other questions from the committee? Um, I just had one. I, I note that you've, over the last couple of meetings, have been telling us about the 700000 that we might, that we will project to run over. As of today and looking into the next seven months, um, is, is that, that's well grounded. We, we, we have funds to cover it this yes. year? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and that's through the a the There's a $500,000 reserve that would have to be voted um, by town meeting, and we have reserves from prior years from the tuition in account. Okay. Just, just, sorry, just a quick expansion. Is that a, this overage? Is that a result of uh, increased enrollment and uh, additional special education expenses for the most part? There are more students placed out of district than there had been, okay. and some of the students that have gone out of district have. We've had a couple with very expensive placements. But the additional. Uh, uh, student population is is that been a factor as well? I know it's not as much. It, 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 I don't in this case. In the the overage is an out of district tuition, and that I I can't mm -hmm. tie that directly to enrollment pressure. Okay. Though I would say it's logical to assume that as our numbers grow, It'll overall it will add to the pressure of special ed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to our superintendent's report. Yes, I have a, a number of things. Um, but first of all, let me just begin um, with, uh, you know, formally stating our, our meeting that um, we have reached a settlement in the Boris Coughlin case. And, and I'm just going to read a very brief statement about this. Um, the town of Arlington and Arlington Public School System um, is pleased to it, we, are, we are pleased to report that there, as a result of a negotiated settlement, um, the case has been concluded in favor of the town. And that is, I think, all that's necessary to say at this point. I think it's been a long journey, and as a result of this uh, settlement, all parties are going to be able to move forward. Um, I want to also address another topic I know that's been on a lot of people's minds over the last, um, this, this week in particular, and that is the issue of security. Mm -hmm. We're in the, the week of the anniversary of Sandy Hook, and I know there's been a lot of news about that. And, and I think when we revisit in an anniversary, it just brings up a lot of issues around feelings of security in our buildings. Um, and. I think that all schools, and I can speak specifically here for Arlington, have, have 
really changed their mindset about security in the last a number of years as a result of these tragedies, in including in a whole variety of different ways. Certainly there's the physical security of the buildings, and all of our buildings now are, are locked. Uh, we still have areas where we'd like to have more cameras. We're going to be looking to funding for that. We have um, a couple of buildings we want to put some alarms on or some uh, additional intercoms so that there's a better sight line and perhaps they're not opening the door within a vestibule. So we're, we're working on all of that. Different protocols that used not to be in place are in place. When teachers go off to recess, the doors are locked and they have a key to come back in um, or have to buzz to come back in. So those are in place. I, this, and we continue to do this. This is something that we are not complacent about. It's something that we are continually looking at ways that we can improve. Here at the high school this year, um, we have someone that now sits at the front desk and when people come in, they have to sign in. They get, they get badges to go to where they need to go. And uh, so we have a little bit better, a lot better um, sense of who is coming in the building. But there are other areas, too, where I think that we need to continue our work. And, and actually, while the physical part of it certainly is a focus, another part that we are working on as an administrative team and certainly in partnership with the, the police department is just uh, commu new, making sure that all staff, because we do have new staff every year, are aware of all the protocols and aware of all the safety procedures that, that we have in place. And in each one of the rooms, we do have a little flip book mm -hmm. that has um, information. And we're in, I have encouraged principals to make sure that there's ways that they can make sure that teachers are aware of what's in those booklets, particularly our newest teachers who are not, um, who haven't gone through some of the professional development or more veteran teachers have done. But we have a very strong um, and positive relationship with the police department, and they have been enormously supportive in many, in many situations this year. Um, but what is also a, a great asset to the Arlington Public Schools is that Arlington belongs to NEMLEC. Mm -hmm. And in that, um, and in that uh, relationship, we have access to resources that we would not have otherwise, which includes the, the STARS team. And you know, every, every uh, part of the STARS program, which is an acronym for School Threat Assessment and Response System, we have books like this for every school. Mm -hmm. And one of the little things we did this year to change one of our protocols is that these, these contain maps of all the schools with exits and just where all the rooms are located. And um, while our, the police department have these maps on their computer systems in their, in their vehicles, mm -hmm. electronics can sometimes break down, and that can happen, or they, they're slow to input and, uh, or to upload. And so one of the things we do is this is now part of the, the package of materials that go out of the school mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a, um, a fire drill or mm -hmm. a, any kind of evacuation so that we also have a hard copy um, on site in, in case of an emergency. So we're working on these types of, of, of changes, just little, little things which can make a big difference. I think of emergencies, mm -hmm. you know, there's certainly the emergencies that we're, that we're mm -hmm. concerned about in terms of intruders, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of other kinds of emergencies that happen, and we need to make sure that the communication systems are in a good, good working order, that everybody knows what they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. where they're supposed to go, how teachers can, what are the, one of the things that we're working on is how can we communicate with teachers other than email through some kind of a, um, um, a text-based mm -hmm. methodology. So the focus this year is really on uh, re reflecting on our current, our current communication systems mm -hmm. and improving them, streamlining them, making them more known to all of the, uh, all the staff. So I did want to, to do this to mention this because I do think that uh, there is still there's, and rightly so there's a lot of concern about safety mm -hmm. that um, 
that exists in a community. Oh, sure, mm -hmm. I'll pass this along. So I don't know if anybody had any questions on that one before I go on to some other mm -hmm. issues on Just the report. Down at the uh, school committee conference, I, I went to a seminar on the SCARS program. I'm deeply impressed, and I'm very happy that we're involved with it. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, actually, I was going to have Laura talk a little bit about the code, uh, the code program there, but I think it's pretty much covered. Unless there's anything you'd like to say. Um, just briefly, I just want to let you know that Audison, a thousand students of the students at Audison Middle School have participated um, in the Computer Science Education Week, which is the code.org that he was talking about. Um, they participated with the 11.5 million students in 160 different countries. And this will be just a preview of the um, uh, grant that we were recently awarded um, through Apple and, I'm sorry, through Microsoft and Google to train four of our teachers to be able to offer more computer science classes. So Microsoft and Google will be, um, we were one of the eight school districts in Massachusetts that were selected to have our teachers, um, to have two teachers at the middle school and two teachers at the high school trained so that we can offer more computer science classes next year. Um, I want to then um, talk about the high school. We've talked a lot about that this evening. But I wanted to um, mention that this last week we received a notification from Mass Massachusetts School Building Authority, which I forwarded to you, that the window has now been set for submissions of statements of interest, which we call SOIs. Mm -hmm. Um, and that window is uh, to April uh, 14th. April, I'm sorry, April 11th. So it, it is as the representative from mm -hmm. um, Massachusetts Building Authority told me, the window is pretty much the same as it was last year. So we are, we have already been working on different components of that statement of interest. But one that I know that is of interest to Board of Selectmen and to the Capital Committee is actually having an architect take a look at the layout of the building from a programmatic standpoint. Now, you've heard a lot about that discussion this mm -hmm. evening, just in terms of science classroom sizes, um, adequate space for um, any of our classrooms, for that matter. And that's one of the things that we are also going to undertake over the next uh, few weeks with, with the plan reporting out probably sometime late January, early February, which, could, which will add to what we, we, we are able to say in the statement of interest. I think that what's going to be very compelling uh, about our statement of interest is, of course, the facilities. But there are a lot of facilities in the Commonwealth that need updating. But when you combine mm. the state of the facilities mm. the, and how crowded the facilities are mm -hmm. for the enrollment growth that we're getting, that is going to be what's be, going to be very compelling in our application. Mm. So I think that, um, that we're, I'm, I'm looking at doing more tours um, as we move into mm -hmm. the winter. I think it's, it, it, uh, you know, mm -hmm. with thousand words so I'm also going to um, look into having some kind of a, a walkthrough video done mm -hmm. that can be that I hopefully will work with ACMI to be able mm -hmm. to have shown because mm -hmm. a lot of people aren't going to be able to do it it's it's both tours have taken two hours it, granted we're talking as we go through it but we haven't even done we've just done yeah, a few a few of the pathways. It's qu it's quite um, it takes quite a while to move through this complex, but I think it's helpful for people to understand um, and see what the facility looks like. Um, we probably would have the video without students in it uh, for a lot of privacy issues, but we might. I think seeing a mm -hmm. class of thirty students in a room can give you a much better idea mm -hmm. of what that's like, particularly in a science room, and also seeing the the lack of, maybe not say, the lack of vision points that you can see the, the board in uh, many of these rooms. And so th this part is moving forward. And um, 
thank you for those of you who participated. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you found it very worthwhile. And in fact, mm -hmm. I know, Jeff, you said you should do more of these. And I, mm -hmm. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. We need to do some more. And I was talking with um, Matt Janger about this. So we may involve a, a bigger day mm -hmm. uh, uh, where we have maybe we can allow mm -hmm. 100, 150. We'll have to think of what the number might be and involve students mm -hmm. uh, so that we'd have different and go different places in the building in a, in a tour path so that we can do more in one day. Mm -hmm. So we're working on doing something like that and I'll certainly let you know as we get that planned. I, I, w I want to thank you and the, uh, and, the, and the staff for opening the, the school up on Saturday and bringing us through it. It, w it was hugely instructive. You know, I knew we had problems in the building just from being in the building, but I've never really looked at it, it with that critical eye. And things that I thought were okay, I learned weren't. And the building's in a lot worse shape in terms of design, in terms of initial construction in terms of our you know, systems, uh, the, 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 we haven't neglected things, we've maintained it as best we can. But given what we have, it is woefully inadequate, it is functionally uh, obsolete, there are significant problems that need to be addressed and, uh, and the problems are greater than I ever expected. So the more people who are able to see this, uh, the better the case you're going to make. And I'm looking at the other high schools that have been on the list for the state, and, and, and I can't think that uh, some of these other buildings would hold a candle to the issues that, that we're facing right now. So uh, the town really should be encouraged to move forward, both based on the need and the desire to do the right thing and for the uh, uh, potential loss of accreditation in 10 years. I went to the previous tour, and what was more enlightening, I agree with Mr. Schlickman, I thought I knew the building, and some of the size of the classrooms, and Dr. Borney and I were talking about the the danger of so big guys in the back of a room getting caught in the chairs and stuff. Uh, one of the people that came with us was a former <coughs> student, here, and she kept talking about what it was, what it was, and what now it isn't. And I would suggest if you put the video together, get a range of people to make comments about what they had, mm -hmm. the great place it was at one time and what it's becoming uh, mm -hmm. to add to it. Uh, she was very shocked. Yeah. I think that is um, a very good point. In fact, um, the person you're talking about was, went here when there were um, relatively large class sizes. But we, I've also talked with people whose children went here when there were 3,000 and people say, well, I don't understand why you're crowded when, you know, we had 3,000 here. But this was a science room at that time. Yes, mm. there had been different uses. And, and this may be, a, but then at one time in town, there were, in fact, two different locations for administration. Mm. I think there was, a, at one point, there was even a white little building on the front lawn here mm -hmm. that was administration. So mm -hmm. that building was torn down and administration moved in here. Well, it's possible that in this we, I don't know, it's possible to go somewhere else, but the question is, where? And the other question is, the you know, the preschool. But even at that time, we had a more robust um, uh, technical program as well. And we do have some spaces down there that are just not a huge space. It's not used except for crew, storing our crew. And <laughs> <laughs> I love that we store the boats down wow. there. Yeah, it was, that was fun. Yeah. yeah. That was fun. But also, as we've been having these discussions about the space, I haven't been hearing us talk about the fact that the expectations on the teachers and the instruction mm -hmm. really has changed tremendously because mm -hmm. we're not expecting our teachers to have the children sitting in rows, mm -hmm. right. which is a much more compact mm -hmm. right. usage of that space. Mm -hmm. That's right. We're modeling them for their college work, mm -hmm. for their career mm -hmm. work, and that involves working in groups. Mm -hmm moving throughout the periods. We've gone to longer periods, which mm -hmm. require more transitioning. Mm -hmm. and, and all of those have impacted mm -hmm. how we use our space as well. You make a very good point. That's what I was saying earlier, we've seen the classrooms with the groups. You, when you turn the desks like that, you can't move. Mm -hmm. It's when you have these really large class sizes, even if a teacher wanted to do groups, what they often do is just put them in rows. Or they make horseshoes that are right so that you can get as many desks in there. Um, actually, that was a problem at the beginning of the year. 
a lot of classrooms didn't have enough desks for the, the large sizes we had. So yes, the usage has changed. Um, the, the, what goes on in science rooms have changed, the use of technology, but the, the collaborative work. And in fact, a lot of the new schools that are built have some more, more spaces where students can collaborate. Um, and that's a challenge. I mean, I, my hat is off to the eighth grade science teachers. All the kids didn't do the work there. The, st the kids still have to, if they're going to do any kind of group work in the middle school, that's, it's, again, it's the same thing. They're just finding it hard to, to maneuver all the, into those spaces. So it's a, it's a journey we have to, we're going down. And I think the more people that get educated about this, the more they can understand that why we need to move forward. All right. Um, well, Matt Janger already told you about the um, Presidential Scholar nomination. That is just terrific. And uh, our congratulations to her, and hopefully she becomes a national presidential scholar. Um, I also wanted to let you know, speaking of another facility, that we are, have begun um, the process of looking at Stratton in terms of planning for the future. A Stratton Building Committee has been formed. Mm -hmm. And in fact, maybe I don't know if you want to address yeah, that at this point, but. Yeah, I was going to ask for a vote uh, to have a representative of the school committee uh, be put on the Stratton Building Committee. That's what Mr. was the Thompson person for many years. So moved. Um, I think we had one, we had some interest from uh, Mr. Hayman. I will be happy to do it uh, if uh, Dr. Ampey is not interested. I mean, I will, I will serve if she's not interested in doing it. She may be interested. I know her life is hectic. I don't have those responsibilities. But yeah, yeah, Dr. Ampey is um, fortunately not with us today. Um, that's, a, that's a good well, we can point. We well, will, yeah. so all we're doing, the, the motion is just to appoint oh, someone. Right. Fine. And the chair will figure chair it out. The chair will figure oh, it out. Great. Yes. Our first meeting is this coming Monday, and, and it would be wonderful to have a school committee representative on it, but it's, um, it's been, even if this Monday doesn't work, this is really just a committee formation time and looking at the charge. I think the school committee is very aware of what the charge is moving forward, so I think that the time I second the motion, of Mr. Henry. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. just to form the committee, just to yeah. direct the chair to appoint someone. Right? Yeah, that's, that's great. great. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, just a quick thing. One of the things you'd like to have updates on is how the evaluation system is going, and I, and I think just a quick, I think I'll let Laura talk about that. Yeah, so far we've met every um, date that we've had. Um, we've had a number of trainings also uh, on um, inter-rater reliability, and we'll continue to do that. Um, I meet with a couple of subgroups of um, study groups, uh, one at the middle school and also the special education folks. So um, I think we're doing pretty well with the new evaluation system. Not that it's easy, mind you, um, but because it, it, it is quite draining, a number of evaluators have way over what we would really hope for them to have in terms of their evaluation load, but they're, they're handling it thus far. Um, we also are moving forward with um, search committees for the Dallin principal, and a letter is going to go out, which you'll get a copy of, to parents inviting them to participate, uh, and the they'll probably have interviews beginning in the mid-January time frame. Uh, we have a fair number, a, a, ni a nice number of applicants in that um, for that search. We do not have a lot of applications yet in the director of special ed search. So we are going to probably be doing more, some more advertising in this. When we advertise for that, do we do it just in state or do we go beyond? Well, school on spring. school spring, it reaches everywhere. I mean, okay. so people who are looking nationally on school spring will see it. And okay. we've, uh, but we have not, uh, so far, I've not advertised in uh, some of the national education publications uh, other than school spring. But. Thank One you. of the things that we have found, and this is not just in Arlington have found, other districts would say the same thing, because I've certainly talked to a number of people about this, 
it's actually very hard to come in from another state uh, into, uh, into Massachusetts with our special education laws. They are singular. And um, one singular then, sensation. <laughs> there, yes, and much more. It's a nice way of putting it. Yes, and much more detailed. And sometimes they come in with a view of how it's done in another state, which may be closer to um, some more national standards of how special education um, regulations are. And so it's hard to adjust. There's a learning curve. And I'm not saying that we wouldn't entertain applications from out of state, but you know, it would be interesting to know what their experience was. We'll have to look at those applications a lot more carefully, honestly. Now, the other thing, one of the last, in fact, um, is snow. We are at that time of the year. <laughs> here it comes. <laughs> yes, here it comes. And we, we uh, dodged it this week. Uh, we thought there was a potential for ice, which and I'm up at 4.30 looking out the window <laughs> talking to our director of transportation. So that, that process has already begun. But the one thing I need to say at the beginning of any season is that you have to understand what the process is and understand <coughs> when the decision is made. And it is, under, with the best knowledge that we have at that time, is what you know, we're hearing from the, the weather reports, is what DPW is telling us, and sometimes what happens is that Arlington's may be in better shape mm -hmm. than other communities, and DPW does a great job here, and they get out early. They did this last week. They had those, the roads prepared, and I heard this from staff coming in, that once they hit Arlington, it was much better. Definitely. Correct. Definitely. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, we have a great, uh, a great department there in working with us on this. But the issue that the parents have to remember is that if you really feel that it is unsafe to get out on the road yourself to, to, to bring your, your child to school or for them to walk, you, I really encourage you to use your discretion. We make the decision based on what we feel the roads are and get advice on that. And that, those decisions are often made at 5.30 in the morning. I know last year there were a couple of instances where it changed. Mm -hmm. And nobody predicted it. And that happens. And then the tough one is when it's not going to change and it's going to be really difficult in the early afternoon. It would have to be a dire situation to um, early dismiss. Once, once our kids are here, particularly elementary, they're here until the end of school because we cannot dismiss, we cannot have children going home if we know that they're not, there's no one there to receive them. At least in a, in a regular dismissal time, we know that the parents are there have made some other arrangements. So that's another uh, difficult piece on this is what is it going to be at 2.30 2 in the afternoon as well. So I can just tell you a lot of thought Many conversations go on at 5 in the morning and uh, 5.30 in the morning. And uh, so that j j just understand that if you don't agree with the decision, then use your own discretion. And on those days, we will certainly not count that as an absence if, if on those questionable days. As long as it is on October 1st. Well, <laughs> let's hope we don't get those. <laughs> So anyway, that's all I have tonight. Thank you very much. Now, on the high school, I, I had a chance to look at the advocate before coming here tonight. There's a beautiful picture of a high school in 1915 with snow all over. <laughs> <laughs> um, the back page of the first section is really an interesting picture. Just this building. Um, OK, moving on to subcommittee report. Consent well, agenda. Consent agenda. <laughs> I want to pull something out of here but, um, in November 21st. Uh, minutes. November 14th minutes, right? Um, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the so requests, which event the item is considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant 14069 dated November 21st, total warrant $691,776.63. Approval of draft minutes regular school committee 
November 21st. Second. Aye. Aye. On November 14th, I just had a small question. We have all our evaluations in here. Mine didn't seem complete. Um, I didn't know, I didn't really catch everyone else's, but I, I, I thought I had more pages that goes. Um, for example, section one, four competencies from number one to number three. So I think number two is missing. I might just want to review those. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, section two strategic goals goes from strategic goal one to strategic goal three. So it's like at least one page is missing there. So I I don't have the full and complete evaluation of mine in front of me, but I'd be happy to put that to you. Any anyone else on their evaluations if their page is missing or things incomplete? You know, it's a pretty big big minute package. So um, So we'll just do it again. Can we just try it again? Do we work on that? Okay, great. Thanks. <coughs> All right. Um, Subcommittee liaison reports, policies and procedures. Yeah. We are uh, working to schedule a meeting in January. That's when Rebecca Bryant's going to be ready with uh, information on our policies. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our next meeting is Tuesday, the 17th of December at 6 p.m. up here. Um, we are going to, uh, that follows the day before. Uh, just a reminder for those of you who want to go long term planning. Uh, at 8 a.m. on Monday the 16th uh, is taking up I think they're coming up with some scenarios or some ideas on uh, how much additional funding the schools need um, so wanted to make sure our meeting was after that so our plan is to take up budget long-term budgeting and um, we had a request uh, to be heard on athletic fees shocking I know um, so both of those are on the agenda what? No, we hear it every year. That's what I'm saying. I'm not. Okay. Curriculum instruction assessment accountability. I know Dr. Allison Abbey is scheduling the meeting for next week. I think it's next Wednesday. It's Wednesday at 6:30 p.m. Oh, great. That's Wednesday the 18th, right. 6:30 p.m. Okay. In this room, water will be served. <laughs> awesome water. Awesome. Thanks for water. <laughs> Maybe some pretzels. And Maybe pretzels. some pretzels. Sometimes Dr. Bordy brings pretzels. <laughs> All pretzels. Bread and water. All right. Facilities. Nothing at this time beyond what was uh, said about the tours, and I'm happy the idea going forward is to have the wall. I think. And you get acne in here for sure. I think that's a great doing a video, idea. Video, I think will really help. Yeah. I yeah. want it played three times a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was interesting that the. The showers, some of the, the student who had been here who is now no, no longer a student, she's like, Yeah, I don't think the showers ever work in the locker room. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're just there, they just don't work. Oh, God. Just, just, yeah, sure. Uh, at this time, I'd like to move that a legal review subcommittee be established to review all legal invoices on a monthly basis and report to the full committee periodically. Second. Why? Nice. Be I'd like to get the rationale. Because we had done it before and we're. Uh, these two of the former members, uh, I don't know <coughs> we are now getting the uh, monthly invoices in an Excel spreadsheet to look at. And uh, can, if we don't do it in a subcommittee meeting, the questions are going to be, have to be asked and discussed in a full time meeting. Sometime, a lot of these questions can be resolved in a subcommittee meeting. I was just saying there was some unfinished business from last year, too, um, with regard to Dr. Allison Anthony and Mr. Hainer and myself. We were uh, going back and forth, not only in terms of trying to figure out if we should go for another contract for Stoneman, Chandler, and Miller, but we were also noticing that um, there was there was usage issues about um, who who is a, allowed to actually address or contact the law firm, and there may be protocols necessary to put in place to sort of delineate really who is supposed to call and who who can call because every call is a is a charge. And we were finding that that was becoming a little bit of an issue. Don't we have, what do we have? We have a legal services subcommittee now? It, it was no, temporary. No, it was temporary. Yeah, so year. you're trying to add a permanent committee? No, 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 no. no, no. I'm sorry. Did I? It didn't. Well, it doesn't said, have an ending or anything. So here's the thing. Then, okay. The it, 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 I apologize. I think the policy says that these are temporary uh, uh, ones, and, and they're not uh, permanent uh, ones. And the 
the end of the school year. Does the school committee determine in May, uh, yeah. in April? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think it needs to say that or else we have to go through two readings, policies and procedures. I mean, there's a, okay. so, so I mean. I would there. accept any amendment that you'd like to. So it would basically be January to April, just four months? That's all it is. <clears throat> well, till the end of the school year. No, no, it's, it's, it's the, the end election year. The, uh, end of the term when we get a new okay. chair to reorganize. When we have reassignments. Yeah. yeah. So we, we, yeah. So everything dissolves with the new committee. Yeah, defined period for the charge of examining the new Excel spreadsheets and examining usage as our charge for four months. Same, same method, I would request in that fashion. I, I guess my, could the, can we just direct the superintendent to do this? Because you guys, no. are, you guys are trying to kind of schedule meetings and? No. No, this has to be, if we do this, it has to be a, a legal subcommittee because now we've got three school committee members off doing something that becomes an open meeting law issue. Okay. So it has well, to be. I think what you're asking is just not have the school committee. Yeah, why can't we just ask the superintendent to do this? Because I have to tell you, just to try to, to try and schedule meetings and subcommittees okay. is a well, difficult process. We have not had any major problem on doing that, the three of us. Oh. But, you know, it, it, and and I, I guess my feeling is, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I mean, the superintendent doesn't have a law degree. Uh, and we've got two members, that do, three members that do. Uh, so this is one case where you've got a little bit of expertise in looking at this. And uh, from what you guys are saying after looking through it, it, it it's, it's like we're mopping up and finishing the work. So, you know, a, a short-term committee, if you're willing to sit and go over these and sort of look at it with a different lens, I've got no problem. I can confirm for you that the superintendent is a lot smarter than many lawyers. <laughs> well, I won't. I won't. And I, if I may, I'd like to just add, when questioning some of the fees, some of the fees and stuff, Jed and I have both been comfortable with the rationale for the fee and everything. With that part of legal expertise has some bearing. I just think there's a question. We we established a uh, a forty thousand uh, dollar what's that called retainer. Uh, some, and that's changed dramatically from what the retainer was uh, billed down to from the last time. It's basically non-litigation. Uh, but I question that a lot of this preparation, anything that on the SPED could potentially be litigation mm -hmm. and would be then be charged on straight fee and not on the retainer. So that's part of the thing where I'm coming from is understanding this. 99% of these are resolved in the meeting and, not, and never brought forward here. Mm -hmm. It's just going through this stuff. Some questions have been changed. Some of the billing has been changed uh, one or two times. So. Um, I cannot support this. I find this, um, to be honest, inappropriate. I think it is all of our responsibility mm -hmm. to review mm -hmm. the expenses. I think it usurps the responsibility of our CFO and our superintendent who are actually supposed to be directly responsible for monitoring this. And, um, and as far as I'm concerned, as long as I've been on the committee, there has been a very clear protocol for contacting our lawyers, which is any member that has a question around any legal issue refers it to the chair, who then either questions on the part of the committee and disseminates the information or a, sets up a situation in which the, law, the attorney will talk to all the members or will allow an individual member to talk to the attorney. And, you know, I, I pretty much am like, if we're, if we're looking at changing the way we deal with all our legal issues, which is what, to me, this seems like, then let's really do it the right way and actually have a referral to, to revise and uh, do a policy, as Mr. Thielman had inferred. But we had a legal service subcommittee. We asked them for a recommendation. They did that. That work is done. It's now all of our jobs to keep our eyes on the prize. Mr. Hand. That committee initially was not established to make a judgment on the next contract. That came subsequently. No question at all the protocol of this committee of who contacts and the procedures mm -hmm. just. Mm -hmm. Our concern has been how many of the staff can freely pick up the phone and call and we get billed $190 an hour. 
And there are people that need to call. We're st we were still, that was a big piece that we were trying to work out. I have no problem whatsoever that we all take this responsibility and discuss it in an open meeting. I have no problem with that at all. But that's her job. I mean, that's Dr. Bodie's job to pretty much say, mm -hmm. here's our legal expenses, here's who the staff members that should be and shouldn't be, mm -hmm. and you know, in typical school districts, any staff member that does contact the attorney directly is with the superintendent's approval mm -hmm. at some level. Mm -hmm. If Dr. Bodie's saying that that's not happening and that's an issue, I would like to hear it from her and I would like to hear her recommendation about how to go about this. Once again, I don't, I think this is an overstepping of the committee. Um, most of our legal expenses, I would say 90% of them have to do with special education. And when there is a case that is being, where we need to bring an attorney into it, um, the person who is managing that case, and it's, it's always going to be one of our coordinators, it could be our director of special ed as well, that person needs permission to work with the attorney, and that's what happens. Um, below the structure and special ed of a team chair, those, that level of, of uh, staff does not contact directly. Um, I have talked with director of special ed. The coordinators um, always ask her now, that maybe, there, maybe there hadn't always been that um, protocol, but she assures me that they do. She knows that they are working on a case. Um, can we set a dollar amount in terms of how long somebody should speak with the attorney? I think this, go, this can be a difficult thing to do. I do think that we all need to monitor it, and right now there is a, the coordinators are keeping a log of their time that they're using to talk with the attorney. Generally, with respect to the principals, a few times the principals will call directly, but usually that um, is only after we have talked about the issue um, and uh, it's clear that we do need some legal advice. But um, it's, it doesn't happen very often where they, they would not have talked to me first about that. But again, most of this has to do with um, uh, special education. I think we should vote. I don't think a good foundation. No, I don't think it's a good. Reestablish it. Say aye. Aye. All those against? Aye. Can we say a roll call? Roll call. Yeah. Fine. Nay. Yes. Nay. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's defeated. So it's defeated. Move on. When it's an even number, get off. Okay. I hate even numbers in school. <laughs> I hate even numbers oh, in school. Oh, come oh, on. Ball. Don't get mad no. at the <laughs> even numbers. It's not their fault. <laughs> you don't have anything you need to no. say? Okay. Uh, Secretary's report is really long. Uh, we received the following correspondence since our last meeting. Uh, Commissioner's weekly update from Mitchell Chester and the Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Education dated November 22nd. Email from Linda Hansen informing us of a Thompson teacher, Sarah Marie Jette, who was interviewed as part of an MTA Today article on the implementation of the new uh, Common Core and appeared on the cover of the fall 2013 edition. Information from Adam Kay on the paperless meeting that was held it says this week, but that was a couple weeks ago. Um, email from several parents at Audison about class sizes exceeding 30 students, one at 37, and how this is unacceptable. Email from Chair Pierce requesting volunteers to serve on the Stratton Building Committee. Email with a press release, Massachusetts students score among world leaders in assessment of reading, math, and science literacy. Follow-up letter from parents of a Stratton kindergartner regarding the tools of the mind curriculum and its use of the Magic Treehouse books and the discussion on this topic at our last school committee meeting. Uh, email from kindergarten parents at Bishop who opposed the tools of the mind <laughs> curriculum for a number of specified reasons. Email from Mr. Bartholomew about the 521 program at Audison. Email of the sad news of the loss of Marie Carroll's husband, Rich, and information about service arrangements. Email informing the school committee of an off-campus incident involving an Audison student and follow-up emails as details became available. Email of the sad news of the loss of the husband of Deb Perry, David, 
email requesting the redistricting report, which is required in October of each year, article from Pat Tassoni on the importance of music education, email informing us of the passing of Sue Briggs' mother, Bertha Huntley Holmes. Save the date for the American Internship Expo to be held on January 14th, 2014 from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Copies of the thank you letters to the students who presented at the school committee meeting uh, last time from Dr. Bodie. A copy of a thank you letter from Christine Bongiorno, Bongiormi, I don't know, I'm sure I'm slaughtering that, to the school committee for allowing the AHS Jazz Band to play at the AYCC fundraiser. A reminder that AEF stars are a great way to honor a teacher at AHS. Notice that Miss Rose Linsky, who once served as a traffic supervisor for the Arlington School Department, had passed away on November 24th, 2013. Press release about the decision, settlement, and the end of the Boris Coughlin case. Email from a parent requesting the report in APS policy JCE, which was approved by school committee addressing the effectiveness of redistricting. Um, and my response that this will be presented on January 9th and explaining the delay. Email from the superintendent about the MSBA FY 2014 state of interest opening and clarifying email from Mr. Hainer as follow up to that email. And email from Dr. Ampey about questions for the OMS and AHS principals in case she does not make it to the meeting, which she did not, and you asked. Thank you. That's it. That's a lot of email. I apologize. Uh, I just want to mention I attended the Medco conference, uh, and the speaker, Dr. Lee, uh, was a phenomenal speaker. I asked if I could get the material because Dr. Wardy wasn't able to attend. For He had a special breakout with the superintendents. They invited me to sit in. I was the only non-superintendent. I would ask Dr. Bodie to, to see if he's available and we can afford him. I think our staff would benefit greatly from him. He was a fantastic speaker. Sorry, I didn't mention that before. Thanks, Superintendent. Um, at this point, I'd like to enter enter executive session for the purposes of conducting strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel for contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting they have a detrimental effect and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if in an open meeting they have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares coming out for the purposes of adjournment. Adjournment. So moved. Was there a second? Second. Aye. 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 Aye.